Very good. Jack, I'm, I just want to see the attendees pop in so I can ensure that Amherst Media is here. Okay. And there they are. So the other thing I'm going to do, Jack, is make you a co-host. Nate is here. He is also a co-host. We got Nate. That's good. We got Welcome Nate. Back, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> I guess I should see if my video works now that I'm... Uh... <laughs> Does okay. It? There you go. Good yeah, there's go. been some thunderstorms. I don't know if you have it down there, but it's been. Uh... Seems like it's ending up. Why yeah. Not? Before we start, I got to give a warning. My dog is goes bonkers with thunder, and I'm in the basement, but hopefully it doesn't jump in my lap or anything like that. Jack, it's... we're wow. Jack, we're five minutes behind schedule already. Oh, geez. Okay. Here we go. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Um, Welcome to the planning board meeting of July 14, 2021. My name is Jack Jemsik and as a chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media Livestream. Minutes are being taken pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of uh, 2021. This planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the link shown on the slide. The link is also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's um, calendar listing for this meeting, or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Amherst website an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as they as soon as possible after the meeting. Board members, I will take a roll call. I'm gonna call your name, unmute yourself, answer firmly, and then uh, place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman is not with us uh, as she gave us a, you know, a, an excused uh, absence there. So, um, and again, I'm Jack Shumsek. So board members of technical issues arise, let Pam know. And if necessary, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may, may also be heard at other appropriate times in the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Please indicate uh, if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting, Using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So with that said, we can uh, pursue, uh, proceed to the first item, which is the review of minutes, and we have Minutes from June 2nd. Mm -hmm. Just bringing those up, but um, does anybody have any comments on them? I see none. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, Janet. Um, I didn't have a chance to read them, so. Well, yeah, I, I didn't either. <laughs> yeah, they weren't in the packet, and I, I was too yeah. busy looking at the other zoning amendments. Yeah, I'd be comfortable with just putting these in the next, put it on the agenda for the next time. I think that'd be a good thing. Um, Chris, did you have your hand up? I just wanted to say that you could put it off till the next time. So oh, okay, you. all right. So let's do that. Uh, and I don't, we don't need a vote for that, I don't think. No, nope. okay. So, um, we can uh, go to the public comment period. Um, anybody that raises his hand, uh, again, state your name and address. I see Susanna Muspratt. Hi, 
Hi, Susanna. Can you unmute yourself? You Good go. evening, everybody. Um, Hi. I would just like to thank the planning board and the planning department for all of your hard work on the inclusionary zoning amendment and the ADU amendment. I think both of those came out very well in the end of a process that was careful and deliberative. Um, and they really do address problems in our town. I am really worried about the fast pace of the various amendments we're gonna be talking about tonight. I think it's hard enough for the public to keep track and I'm sure it must be a big burden on the rest of you. There've been so many changes that happen not in the context of these meetings. And I just hope that you will take your time and be careful and not let yourselves be pressured by other people's timetables to let these go to the council until you feel really behind them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, and we have Gordon Green. State your name and uh, address, please. Hello, Gordon. Hi, my name is Gordon Green. I'm at 150 Montague Road in Amherst. Did you hear that? Yes, we hear oh. you. Yeah. Yeah, I would second those comments, and just I just wanted to mention just generally, um, just the concept of I know um, the issue of affordable housing is is a big one when considering various developments and whatnot. And I just wanted to raise the concept also of intergenerational affordability, and that uh, large rental developments d don't address intergenerational wealth disparities, whereas. Um, condos and other kind of purchase developments do. And I don't know if that kind of enters into the planning board's thinking, but I, I do think that, um, you know, more rental developments, even though they may be affordable, long term don't really help to address uh, intergenerational wealth disparities. And I just wanted to mention that it might be. I don't know if there's a mechanism by which that can be considered in terms of approving various development projects. That was, that was all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. And I don't see any other hands at this time. So we can, again, we have a, a very full uh, slate. And again, uh, because of the, 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 the amount of material, we're gonna limit the planning board comments to 30, so three minutes at a time, and, and there can be an extension on the request, but we just uh, would like to get through uh, this the best we can. And uh, I mean, uh, and I'd ask Chris at this time just to kind of uh, frame this and, and, you know, whether are we indeed hurrying through this or do we have an opportunity to continue the hearing if we're not satisfied with the amount of public comment or if we haven't you know, got it through ourselves. So uh, if you want to go over that, I'd uh, appreciate that. Yes, you do. This, um, these items that you're going to be hearing about tonight, three of them are on a schedule for a public hearing on July 21st. You certainly do have an opportunity to continue the public hearing for as long as you need to gain the information that you need or to gain the understanding or to hear from the public or whatever it is that you need after the public hearing starts, there's really no um, limit on how many times you can continue the public hearing. So until you're ready to vote, you can keep continuing, so. And then and then, uh, can town council uh, act uh, if we have not concluded the hearing? No, town okay. council needs to wait until you make your recommendation. Okay, all right. Uh, Janet, um, I'm not sure. Oh, you make a comment. Are we? I don't know if we're talking about our schedule and why we're going at this fast pace, or why the hearing was scheduled. You know, three or maybe public hearings next week for issues that we have barely looked at, and whether we need to. to whether I, I just want. Are we going to talk about this now or at the end of our fast paced for zoning amendments? I I feel like we have you know some time to at least make some initial comments and then have the public speak on each of the four topics uh, tonight. Okay. And again, okay. I, I think this is a, like a directive from town council. It is not from which, town which, council. Town council has not asked us to schedule these hearings quickly. So well, if 
Somebody has uh, asked it, but it's but, not in the <laughs> Well, I think, I think uh, um, planning department certainly has, I think, gotten marching orders to do certain things. So there, uh, and that's maybe from CRC, maybe not the full town council, uh, but you want to clarify, Chris? Well, I guess I would recommend going through the items that you have on your agenda. Um, it was mentioned that people felt like they didn't really um, necessarily have a complete understanding of what was being proposed. This is your opportunity to learn about what is being proposed. And then um, we'll talk about the uh, upcoming public hearings afterwards. But I think this is a good opportunity to hear about what's being proposed and for you to discuss these items and also to hear from the public. Um, so I would move along with the, um, with the agenda. And then if we have time later, we can talk about the process. That would be my recommendation. Okay, I see one hand in the public uh, that might not have, uh, might have just arrived. That's Janet Keller. Janet, you wanna state your name and address, please. Hi, Janet. Hi, um, Janet Keller, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question um, uh, as to what uh, is happening tonight is, do I understand that it's a public hearing? And did I mishear you, Jack, when you said earlier that uh, the public couldn't comment on the items on the agenda tonight. Was that, did I get that wrong? Could someone clarify for me? Yeah. It's what just, is this and what is happening here? Thanks. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that we, we are allowing public comment. And I'm just, I just, I was suggesting to the planning board members that we will probably watch the clock a little bit just so we can get through everything. And then the, the, and then, as Chris said, we we are going to have a public hearing on this. And if we're not satisfied with the with the public comment that we've, you know, uh, that we've received, or that we want to debate this further, we will not conclude the hearing, uh, which is going to be what July twenty fourth on some of these items. So, this is, um, you know, our review of, of of this, and it's only, you know, initial uh, in nature, and the actual hearing will be at a on that July twenty fourth day with. I believe it's a joint hearing with CRC. So, um, excuse me, it's the twenty-first. Sorry. Oh, twenty-first. I'm sorry. Twenty-first. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Janet. So, we we are not following any process that I recognize from past practice, in that we are being presented with zoning amendments at public hearings, like the CVS lot last week. Um, the parking zoning amendment wasn't on anybody's list and just sort of showed up and we haven't talked about it and we're going to a public hearing next week with really no information, like no data. And then the BL sort of showed up on our agenda when we talked about holding this, this meeting for just three zoning amendments. And so, I mean, I can go down this list um, before the planning department just sent three zoning amendments to town council without informing the planning board and the planning director scheduled it had on her schedule that we would meet within three weeks go to a public hearing the town council has not asked us to rush we have not gone through these amendments we talked about mixed use a fair amount we were fine toothing it all of this work used to be done by the planning board and the zoning subcommittee Last year, we decided that the whole planning board could do the work of the zoning subcommittee, not realizing that we're gonna face 18 zoning amendments with, you know, that seem to pop almost week by week. And it's clear that we are not doing the job that we need to do, not we don't have the data, we haven't had the language. There is really literally no reason I can think of for us to go to public hearing without doing our regular process um, and some diligence. I'd be happy to do some pop-up zoning subcommittees and work on things and, you know, Doug, you know, work on the language. But I, I literally want to know right now, why is this being rushed? Because the town council has not said to rush. Is the town manager pushing these through? Does the CRC, the three, you know, the five members of the CRC, we have a member in the audience. What is the, 
what is the purpose of rushing right now? I can't find any reason that we have to revise a parking bylaw. Why would we do the BL without doing downtown planning and the consultant? I can go through one after another, but nobody has explained to me why the planning board is, why, what's, why, what is the, who is asking us to go fast? Like okay. this. Yeah. Five Thank you. Right now. Thank you. Uh, Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah, I had a, some comments um, because I, kn I knew this topic would probably come up and um, thought this might be helpful. Um, so there have been recent comments about the uh, process and the relation of the process to the flow chart that was voted on by the planning board and the CRC last May. Um, and I believe that we have been following the process as outlined in the flow chart. The planning department has been working with the town manager to respond to the request of town council to work on zoning amendments. The town council voted on certain zoning priorities on January 4th and the town manager requested that the planning department work on these priorities. On February 22nd, the planning department gave a presentation to town council on the zoning priorities that the council had requested and also a list of zoning priorities that the planning department and the building commissioner thought were important. The town council agreed that the planning department should begin to work on this list. The planning department presented information on this list of zoning priorities to the planning board on January 20th and February 3rd. And throughout the months of February and March, <clears throat> the planning department presented information on zoning priorities to the planning board and the CRC. On May 12th, the planning department presented draft zoning amendments on mixed use buildings and on apartments. Mixed use buildings had been listed as a planning department priority and apartments had been listed as a town council priority as uh, on the lists that we had presented to town council. There was discussion at that meeting about both of these topics, and there was a suggestion made by Planning Board member Janet McGowan that we should move any zoning amendments related to parking and related to mixed use buildings and apartments into the parking section of the bylaw. So we drafted a small amendment to the parking section of the zoning bylaw to accommodate the proposed change in parking regulations with regard to mixed use buildings, apartments, and uh, uh, accessory dwelling units as suggested by Ms. McGowan. On June 16th, the planning department presented a refined draft of the mixed use building bylaw to the planning board. There was a robust discussion. I think it lasted over two hours. And one planning board member stated that he thought the mixed use building zoning amendment was not ready to go to town meeting. The planning board agreed to hold an additional meeting on July 14th to discuss mixed use buildings, apartments and parking. After the June 16th planning board meeting, the planning department and building commissioner reached out to the member who had expressed concerns about mixed use buildings. And we uh, met with him and we believe that we resolved his concerns. On, Ju on June 28th, the planning department and the town manager presented mixed use buildings, apartments and parking to the town council with the request that the council refer these zoning amendments to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. At the June 28th town council meeting, a statement was made that the planning board had agreed that the mixed use buildings, apartments and parking zoning bylaws were ready. I corrected that statement and made it clear that the planning board had not voted to say that these amendments were ready, but that the planning board was meeting on July 14th to further discuss the proposed amendments. There's nothing in state law or in the charter that requires the planning board to make a judgment or take a vote on zoning amendments that are being developed prior to bringing them to town council. The only requirement is that the planning board hold a public hearing and make a recommendation to town council on a proposed zoning amendment. The planning board is scheduled to hold a public hearing on these items next week. We're in a new form of government now and the way that zoning amendments are proposed has changed. The planning board has a very important role in hearing presentations about proposed zoning amendments offering suggestions and recommendations on how to revise zoning amendments and holding a public hearing on zoning amendments that have been referred to them and making a recommendation to town council. But they are not required to make a statement about whether a zoning amendment is ready for presentation to town council. Town council requested that the town manager present zoning amendments. The planning board has been working on drafting these zoning amendments and has tried to keep the planning board and the CRC informed about the progress that is being made. 
there was a discussion about mixed use buildings, apartments and parking at the May 12th planning board meeting. And there was a discussion about mixed use buildings at the June 16th planning board meeting. There will be a public hearing about mixed use buildings, apartments, parking and accessory dwelling units at the July 21st joint meeting of the planning board and the CRC. If the planning board believes that it is not ready to vote on the amendments on July 21st or has not received enough information, the board can vote to continue the public hearing. The board also has the option of voting not to recommend the zoning amendments if it disagrees with what is being proposed. Thank you. Very good. All right, so let's move on uh, with our meeting. So uh, going on to zoning priorities, uh, the first one is a continued discussion about proposed changes to apartments, section 3.323 of the zoning bylaw, definition standards and criteria. And you have a presentation. We have Maureen Pollack who's going to present apartments. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, let me Hello. pull up. Um, let me pull up. Um, can you see my screen? Not yet. No, not yet. So, because I didn't. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me pull this up. Uh, pull. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, thank you everyone for uh, having us here tonight. Um, I will be talking about uh, apartments. Um, Nate Moloy will be talking about mixed use buildings and then I will return to talk about um, parking. So uh, we'll start first with the apartment section. Um, this could be repeat information. So I will go um, uh, fast and steady or slow and steady, whichever is preferred. So uh, apartments, uh, the existing definition um, for an apartment is one or more buildings, each building containing no fewer than three and no more than 24 dwelling units. Uh, I'll go through the existing standards and conditions. So an apartment development would need to be located um, close to a heavily traveled street or streets, close to a business, commercial, or educational district, or in an area already developed for multifamily use. Um, uh, continuing with existing standards and conditions, uh, it needs to be connected to the town sewer, it needs to meet the dimensional regulations. Uh, there are special provisions for apartments that are located in the neighborhood business zoning districts, uh, which is uh, about nine parcels um, around the corner of Main and Triangle Street. Um, there is a provision about bedroom counts where it says no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units shall be of any one size, and it needs to apply with the design review standards and princ uh, principles and standards. And so the proposed amendment language uh, is to firstly to remove the maximum number of units allowed per building opposed to having that cap of 24 uh, units uh, per building. And uh, the rationale for that is, is um, you know, we want to encourage more housing in Amherst, um, it, which is reflected in, in the housing protection um, plan, as well as other documents. And um, for potential concerns of, oh, you know, will there be, you know, more apartments than desired? you know, it should be noted that the dement table three, uh, the dimensional regulations that is in the zoning bylaw will dictate a number of things that will um, dictate the number of units for that particular um, parcel. So for instance, it'll dictate the bulk and mass of, of each building, the number of units based on the basic lot area and additional lot area per lot uh, per unit particularly in the limited business district, which uh, uh, requires that there's uh, 4,000 square feet for additional uh, lot area per family. And uh, if you remember the footnote M discussion, uh, that also would require uh, additional 4,000 square feet per additional lot area per unit. And, um, and thirdly, uh, for zone, zoning districts in the limited business district, um, there are um, special provisions that um, get into floor area ratio at 0.3, which really um, um, uh, dictates and requires that uh, the amount of units is, is, is very, very limited to, um, um, to a very small amount. 
Um, and I, I can certainly provide more information on that if needed. Um, and so apartments are allowed in zoning districts uh, that are located in our downtown and village centers. And that's where we want to encourage more residential development. We want to encourage more residential development that are on or near bus uh, routes and stops, walkable to our retail shops, to Amherst College, to uh, UMass Amherst. Um, and, um, and so um, th that is, uh, you know, very supporting of having apartments um, in particular is to have them in walkable, uh, walkable neighborhoods such as downtowns and our village centers. Um, additionally, uh, uh, apartments are allowed in special are allowed by special permit in most uh, zoning districts in Amherst, um, and um, the zoning board um, has the discretionary power to approve a use of a special permit. So, unlike a site plan review, which is a uh, a, is a use by right. The, so for instance, the planning board reviewing site plan review, you're, you're, um, that those are uses that are by right. And so, you, you know, more or less, you're, you're gonna be looking at, at the site plan and lighting plan, uh, parking plan, looking at traffic studies. The zoning board of appeals um, is actually looking at the, whether uh, the use is in harmony uh, with the neighborhood um, as, um, and is in sync with the neighborhood. And um, they look at um, uh, section 10.38 for their specific findings. And so they do have the discretionary power to deny a use by special permit. Um, and so we feel that removing the cap of 24 units per building is something that we want to encourage with the note that there are already in the zoning bylaw a lot of um, you know uh, existing rules and regulations that will help guide that and not be sort of overwhelming in in, in density uh, uh, quantities. Um, the, secondly, so uh, moving on to the second bullet point on the slide is to update the standards and conditions. And that is uh, one is to diversify the bedroom count for 10 units plus. And so, uh, so no more than 50% uh, of the total number of dwelling units can have the same bedroom count is the proposal. Um, we've, we felt that less in um, an apartment building with nine units or less um, that could be sort of discouraging to, uh, to limit the, the types of bedrooms or the, uh, the amount of number of bedrooms. But once you get to 10 units or more, uh, we would we would not only encourage, but would, would require the, uh, that there would be a diverse uh, amount of bedroom counts per, um, per apartment development. Um, we also are proposing um, uh, standards about enclosed parking, enclosed parking within the building or under the building um, that would be on the first or ground floor and that would be required that they would be in the rear of the building and designed to reduce the visibility from the public right of way and walkways. Um, we are also proposing to revise uh, the permit path for apartments in two zoning districts. Currently it is by uh, let's see here, by site plan review in the general business zoning district. And we're proposing that it should actually be uh, permitted by approval of a special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, because that is a, a zoning district that we want to encourage, as the word says, businesses, uh, uh, commercial mixed use businesses, uh, mixed use buildings and the like. Um, and so uh, we felt that that would be a more applicable um, permit path um, for an apartment um, to be a special permit. And then uh, in the village center residence zoning district, uh, it's currently allowed by special permit. And as the word, uh, the zoning district names suggest, village center residence, um, that is, uh, uh, you know, like all village centers, those are the perfect uh, or ideal locations to have 
more residential units. And so we would want to encourage that more apartments would be located. And so that is sort of the premise of why we're so, uh, recommending that, that, that apartments would be allowed by approval of a site plan review through the planning board. And I will now um, hand it over to Nate Malloy. And um, I don't know if we're gonna I think do we're, questions. I think yeah, I think we're going yeah, to do discussion on each on each topic. Okay, great. So let's open it up to the uh, to the planning board here for initial comments, and then we can uh, open it up to the uh, public. And again, uh, three minutes for the planning board members, and and that obviously for the public as well. Um, and I see um, Doug, please. Thanks, Jack. Um, Thanks, Maureen, and thanks to Chris and to Rob. Um, it looks like you have removed the language that was starting to get into the form of the building and the dimensional uh, requirements related to, uh, I think you called it the front yard or the setback. Um, and, and it sounds like we will be dealing with that when we have a consultant to, to look at the dimensional requirements. Uh, this looks really pretty modest, uh, intended to not make uh, buildings that ought to be apartments turn into mixed use buildings because they're not, you know, because apartments have this artificial limit. Um, so I think this looks, looks very modest in its ambition and I have no objections to it. I guess I also feel the need to say that I'm not feeling pressured or to be rushed or anything like that. I feel like we have talked about the apartments and mixed use buildings all spring, um, you know, on, on, on three or four occasions. So, um, you know, what time is, life is limited and we might as well keep the process moving rather than perpetuate it much further. So thank you. Thanks, if you Doug. If you don't mind, I, I would like just to respond to Doug's comment, um, which I'm glad he commented because I because I meant to say this. So regarding, um, as you will see, hopefully later this evening, you, you will um, have a presentation about the, the town center BL overlay district. Uh, which does get into dimensional regulations and it gets into project open space of requiring project open space, requiring a frontage zone um, and those sorts of things. Um, we felt, uh, planning staff felt that, um, that, that dimensional regulations, project open space, uh, frontage zones, uh, thing, uh, things of that nature should be, um, should be, uh, done at the at the neighborhood or the zoning district level, opposed to a, a use, and and this is uh, um, a, a recommended. Uh, uh, if you are if you're familiar with form based codes, that is a specific recommendation that that dimensional regulations, getting into streetscape designs, design standards, those should be um, really ref looked at, studied, and and implemented. Um, at a much uh, larger scale, such as uh, a zoning district. So, uh, and I, and we're very excited to work with a design consultant uh, later this year to really dive into that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Maureen, I, d I have a, a couple of just real simple things. Uh, there's no, uh, with this apartment, um, um, amended apartment uh, bylaw, there's no actual zoning map changes proposed. No, right? because because the map wouldn't change, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the zoning map wouldn't change, but it would okay. be uh, a change uh, reflected in the use classification yes. um, located in Article Three. So that that chart would just change. And, and this melds pretty good with the inclusionary zoning um, article that was has been implemented. Yeah, it would uh, we would have zero. Zero negative effect uh, with the inclusionary mm -hmm. zoning, and, and I would, I would, then say that um, that it would be complementary to inclusionary mm -hmm. zoning. 
Um, and uh, it's, and uh, so uh, I, I think this is good timing to um, study both apartments, mixed use buildings and inclusionary zoning because um, they everything fits together like a system. Okay. And so, yeah, I think it, it's very complementary to the uh, proposed inclusionary zoning. And and then my, my last point, the, the enclosed parking, uh, again, we have a parking bylaw that we're gonna be discussing later, but this just recommends that the, if there is parking, it will be not visible from the street. Is that correct? It'll be behind or? So the language, and I'm happy to pull up the, the draft language, um, so the the enclosed parking um, that's part of this specific uh, proposal is uh, saying that enclosed parking uh, may be located on the first or ground floor um, and it would need to be at the rear of the building couldn't be at the front portion of the building uh, and it could not uh, and, and, and that aim is to uh, reduce the visibility uh, of parking um, from the public right of way. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, Maria, then Janet, and then Andrew. Oh, excuse me, Chris, I'll, I'll put you in the front. And then Maria, Janet, and Andrew. I just wanted to clarify that any lot that has enough space and where a developer wants to put parking and where the permit granting authority thinks that parking is required would be able to have parking on site. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Great. Maria, please. Um, sorry. I'll be quick. Um, this looks really familiar. I feel like we've reviewed almost all these points in the past. And I, I think it's a great combo with this and the mixed use bylaw that we're doing the both of them at the same time, because the reason we're fixing both is because they were conflicting with each other. And I think, yeah, um, having it be a lighter sort of review for the village residential village center and a more um, careful one in the BG makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I, I can't remember what was presented in the past, but this sure looks like the same thing we've seen. Um, and I think it's a, yeah, it's a great step for just getting more housing and um, where it should be located. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you, uh, the comment you just made Maureen about the uh, design standards, the broader design standards being taken out of uses. I totally agree with that. And I saw how you did that with the BL. So, um, but yeah, thanks, this looks great. Thank you. And um, thanks Maria, uh, Janet and then Andrew. So Jack, you just, I have a whole series of questions. So you just want me to, um, I don't know how to do it. I can start and then, I don't know if you're going to give me, I don't think my- oh, I'm, I'm not going to cut you off, <laughs> but oh, I just, I, we don't want to strive for three minutes if, if yeah. you know, so, but just, okay. so, you know, we're not, we just can't go into one o'clock in the morning sort of thing. So I know we don't uh, have enough time to talk about it tonight. So yeah. I will say that we've talked about apartments once. Um, and I did appreciate the, we had asked about what was the history of apartments. And I did appreciate in the packet that you gave a really thorough, um, all the changes in apartments. And in the most recent version or change, when they changed to 24 units per building, not per site, I was wondering what was the vision of the planning department, the planning board and the town meeting um, that they wanted to go to 24 units per building. Um, you know, it seems to have resulted in smaller scale apartments and, and townhouses with lots of open space. And also um, if, you know, there's a minimum landscaping and natural- um, how, about, how about marine answers one by one? Okay, that helps. That helps. Yeah. Well, I will talk about the open space, and maybe Chris can chime in about the mm, the uh, zoning bylaw amendments. Um, I believe that did come from the '70s, uh, when there was a rapid amount of of large scale uh, um, development, um, largely through um, the beginning programs of HUD and 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 community development grant uh, uh, CDBG funding, um, uh, which was a reflection of, of, the, of that time. Um, and so, but I'm, I'm sure Chris could provide some more specific information. Um, and, but about the open space and um, I, um, so currently in the zoning bylaw um, under 10.38, I wish I had the exact number, 
uh, section, I might, I might, but under section 10.38 and under 11.24, there are specific uh, uh, findings that both boards need to make that uh, that get into that there should there shall be adequate open space and recreational amenities. So that is currently there and you can currently use that um, as you review um, any um, application before you. Um, and so um, the reason why we're not addressing landscaping or open space here, as, I, as we had mentioned earlier, is that we feel that A, it's already in the bylaw, and B, we would like to uh, really dive in and study it closely at the zoning district level opposed to a specific use classification. So, uh, Chris, did you want to speak to the 24? Yep, you're on mute. I don't have the planning board report in front of me, but um, my if my memory of discussions around town hall is correct, it was a result of um, apartment buildings were not allowed in the general business district at that time because there was a such a large lot area requirement per dwelling unit that none of the uh, parcels in the downtown area would uh, allow apartments. So most of the apartments were being built out in the outlying areas, particularly in the RN zoning district residential neighborhood. And I believe that town meeting um, and the planning department and the planning board decided that they didn't want large apartment buildings out in those outlying residential districts. So they limited the, um, the number of units per per building to 24 because they wanted to keep them looking like, you know, the boulders and um, South Point and, and that type of development rather than being um, <clears throat> larger than that. Um, I can certainly uh, look to see if I can find the planning board report to town meeting for um, that 1980 change and I will do so. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Janet, you, you wanna proceed? <laughs> My question is um, about the minimum landscape or natural open space. So the requirement is that 40% of that happen, has to happen only in the BN, right? Is that correct? But not the other um, RG, BL, BBC? Yeah, you know, the, there are special provisions in, in the BN um, zoning district, um, which are sort of, um, contradictory to uh, themselves as it, it actually, um, it, redu it reduces the lot coverage by 10%. And, and so um, it, it makes it more prohibitive uh, for having apartments um, as well as um, the floor area ratio uh, really dictates the, the bulk and mass the size of the footprint of the building and the floor area ratio of each each um, floor of the building. So yes, um, there in the BN there is a, a special provision about open space. But now you're you're getting me thinking. So in all the zoning districts, and we'll only talk about the apartments, um, is that there are you know maximum lot coverage requirements for each of the zoning districts, um, and so. Um, you know, lot coverage is is referring to it, referring to impervious surface, um, and so the remainder of that would be open to landscaping, um, vegetation specifically, and pervious surfaces. Um, and I can, because um, now I am very curious and would love to tell you the um, ten point three eight finding about uh, open space. So let's uh, give you a, a second to look that up. And then I'm going to, we'll come back to you, Janet. I'm going to have Andrew um, proceed because we're, we're at 7.15 and uh, we were planning to, you know, uh, move on to public comment for this. Uh, but Andrew, please. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jack. And my, my will be quick. I also, I wanted to echo what Janet said relative to the, uh, the history. That was, it's actually really fascinating to be able to read through that and provide some useful context for me. Um, I did have one question, and I I'm sort of feel like it's an in, inconsistency here. Is, is that in the history section, it mentions apartments are currently allowed by special permit in RBC, BL, BVC, BN, BG. 
I'm sorry, not BG, that's uh, site plan review. Um, but then in the, in, in the definitions table, it shows it's, that it's special permit in RG. Is it, is it in RG or not? In the RG currently, and as proposed, there are no changes, is by special permit in the okay. RG. Okay, then, then it looks like, I think just maybe on page, unless I just missed it, the, the process step on, on uh, page 12 in our packet doesn't mention RG for special permit. Um, okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Oh, well, that, again, that's really good. I, I, we'll definitely um, double check and see if maybe, maybe there was a grammatical error or something. Yeah, and I guess I'll just jump on real quick. So then as, you, as we think about things like the boulders, um, Alpine Comets and so forth, where there's it's more of a campus of apartments where the parking, um, just by the nature of the layout, may not necessarily be behind the buildings. Like, how, how would we manage that? Well, so for in, the parking proposal here as part of the apartment section here is, is uh, uh, talking about enclosed parking. It's not talking about surface parking. And so uh, if a developer so cho chose to have, uh, you know, a garage, uh, or maybe you would say at the existing uh, one East Pleasant Street, they have parking that's un underneath the building on the first floor, uh, okay. we would want that um, at the rear. So uh, surface parking would be uh, dealt separately under Article 7. I'm, I'm, I'm totally good. I misread when I saw rear of the building. I thought I was thinking surface parking. No, so no, no. I'm, uh, I'm totally good now. All right. No, yep, yep. <laughs> Thanks. And to get back to Janet's question about, um, about uh, open space. So under uh, section 10.397, uh, it says, and the ZBA reads these out loud at every meeting, um, when they make their findings, the proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities for the proposed use. And so they go through all these uh, findings and um, they, as they uh, are deliberating on their decision, they are uh, providing responses. And some of, you know, some of these may not be applicable um, like such as there's, you know, a provision like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll, proposal do anything to wetlands. Well, if it's not narrow wetland, then we'll say not applicable. Um, for an apartment building, I would say that that, that use classification would be very uh, applicable to, um, you know, providing adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities for, for the proposed use. Um, and um, so for the planning board, I'm still trying to find that specific section, but it, it is um, the same language at, under 10.38. And so the planning board um, is, is, is very welcome to currently use that. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Janet? So Maureen, thank you for reiterating that because I think I've been making that argument for two years that projects need to have um, amenities and open space and recreational space on site. Um, I, I, I think we can't say that enough. So when I look at um, basically this, it's clear that each zoning different district will be affected differently. You know, building a 24 unit apartment in the village center residence, which is an area for medium density is different from building a hundred unit apartment building in the RBC. And so, you know, the, we know that the different districts have different purposes and they function differently. Like neighborhood businesses is mostly for business and they're looking at, again, moderate density, limited the limited business or BL is areas for moderate density, a transition between the you know, high density uses, commercial uses and residential. And so what I would be looking for is what are the impacts in the different districts and you know what, you know, how um, if you're going from 24 apartments to 100 or 200 is a big change. And so, you know, my question is what could these buildings look like in the different districts? You know, what is the density per acre? And then the question that we asked for footnote M and moving the BL into footnote B is what will they, literally what would it look like? Like what would a big apartment building look like in the BL or the BBC? RVC and the different things. And so, you know, how big can it get? Will they just turn into sort of big boxes instead of sort of smaller buildings 
in a, that are kind of more of a village center look. And so that's the kind of analysis I think we need to see before we can sort of vote on this change. So I would love to see that. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, no, and that, those are excellent questions. And, and uh, you know, my response to you is, uh, you know, in the zoning bylaw, the beginning, it gets into, you know, the listing of all the zoning districts and the purpose of the, those zoning districts. And table three, the dimensional regulations are a reflection of the purpose of each of those zoning districts. Mm -hmm. And so with, with which, as we know, gets into lot area, additional lot area per unit, building height, floors, setbacks, building, it, building coverage and law coverage. And so those are our safeguards that we have instituted, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the town to um, have as safeguards for each of the zoning districts, for each of the characters and, for, and purpose of each of the zoning districts. So, so I, I think that that that, so, that those are the safeguards um, that I, would help limit, um, you know, any concern over over scaled uh, apartment building um, developments. So I, I appreciate that as safeguards, and I also appreciate that over half of the dimensional requirements of the foot of the dimensional table are footnoted, often by footnote A, which is quite quite an um, open door. And so, you know, for the BL. The planning department has come back and showed us several different models of what could be built, you know, in the BL overlay that you're proposing. You know, those are those kind of graphic, you know, discussions really are helpful. And then we've also looked at density per acre, um, how it goes up, you know, what happens if it's waived. And so I think that changing apartments, this definition and expanding the number of units per building is going to have different effects in different districts. And so can we find out what that is? Well, you know, and, and we did in a way uh, with the uh, footnote M study um, back in, in the spring, I guess, uh, where, uh, you know, I, at that time, I was just a, a data wonk looking for, looking for uh, what's going on in the general residence zoning district and how many additional apartments could be provided there with footnote M and without footnote M. And we soon realized um, that, that there really would be no significant increase um, of, of units and uh, if we remove footnote M. And so I encourage you to go through those slides um, because I spent many, 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 many hours on them. And, and, and it will give you an indication of specifically in the general residence zoning district that due to table three of all all the the dimensional reg, uh, requirements it will it will dictate how many units will uh, would be uh, provided on a, a particular parcel good um can we get that analysis though I mean, because those pictures were really helpful and i know that also the the amount of parking required per unit limited how big buildings could get in the rg but now we're talking about that being very flexible requirement so i i think that it would be useful to the town council to the public to the planning board to know like what can we build in these districts how big can it go how dense can it go and get a visual and you might say well this is not appropriate for RVC, it's not a potion for RV, you know, BN is supposed to be businesses, yeah. not apartments, that kind of discussion. So sure. great, great comments, Janet. I think and I think this will come up in the hearing as well. And uh, we're not satisfied. Um, you know, we will be, I think you'll be asking the same questions and, and hopefully get that answered. So no, let's, no, um, yeah, uh, if I could just make, I think those are good uh, comments, Janet, in providing visuals I'm a visual person, uh, so providing visuals of like concept developments to see what that would look like in different zoning districts, I, I think that we will be very useful for future uh, meeting dis discussions, and we can certainly provide that. Thank you, Maureen. So uh, let's go to public comment um, about apartments, what we've been discussing. Uh, I see several hands up. 
uh, Dorothy Pam, and then Susanna, and then Hilda Greenbaum. So uh, state your name and address. Hi, Dorothy. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, I will have to say that I am feeling very stupid. Um, I followed this for months. And every time we talk about something, it's different. And I, I say to myself, why? And I ask, what's going on? So, for example, we used to talk about things and there would be these questions that um, you're now saying, well, they're already in the, the code, this um, section, I guess, 10.38. And if that were in the code and it were listened to and paid attention to, then why are we having such a problem downtown? Or you're saying that they do apply to apartments, but they never applied to mixed use. Um, I mean, they're both residences. Uh, there's people living in them. And the idea that, that, that it is required to have um, some kind of um, recreational space, open space and amenities. Um, I, I have been to many hearings where there was nothing provided. Um, maybe because everybody called it a mixed use. And so, so mixed use somehow didn't have these safeguards in the zoning code. Um, so then I say, well, why, if we're not gonna put the details in, with the details that we spent months talking about, if we're not gonna put them in now, then what is accomplished? And I say, okay, well, I guess you can build buildings easier, but we're gonna do it before we have settled all the questions about that you mentioned, setback design and, and open space. And uh, parking has disappeared in very strange ways because the new parking thing you're gonna say is that nobody is required, the two spaces for um, unit, forget that, not even one space per unit is gonna be required because if there's a bus or if there's some kind of public parking somewhere or a street, then the person who builds the apartment or the mixed use doesn't have to provide any parking. So the only thing you mentioned about parking was if they chose to do it, and put it inside the building, it had to be in the back. Um, so I just see, I just feel a constant sense of loss of things that I said, oh great, they're doing that, this is good. And then it disappears and it's never the same when I see it. Um, so that's why a lot of people feel that we don't know what's going on because it's not like here's a zoning bylaw and we discuss it at a meeting and CRC discusses it and the planning board discusses it and a hearing is held. We never talk about the same thing. It's the river is moving and it's never in the same place twice. And that's how I'm feeling about this. So um, I guess I'll just ask this question. These, the 10.38 in the zoning bylaw, which is supposed to make the, the building in harmony with the neighborhood. Is it true then that none of that has been applying to mixed use buildings and that it only applied to apartment buildings but nobody built any? So that's that's a question right there. Okay, um, Chris, do you want to respond to that? Just you're muted. Um, it's it's really district related, and there hasn't been as much um, focus on open space in the business general, the general business district. General Business District allows 95% um, lot coverage and I think 70% building coverage, if I'm right. Um, and so that really hasn't been, and, and it's also the dense, densest area of downtown. And that's where we've seen most of our mixed use buildings. We do have some um, open space around the um, Barry Roberts building on University Drive, 70 University Drive, that actually has quite a lot of open space. So it's really, context related and what we're uh, planning to do is we're planning to hire um, a consultant to help us to figure out um, design guidelines based on uh, the districts that um, these uses are in. So a mixed use building doesn't necessarily um, have the same requirements and an apartment doesn't have the same requirements in the downtown area as it might have in one of the outlying districts or in the BL, et cetera. So, it's really hard to um, give a blanket determination, this much open space for this type of building, no matter where it's located. 
So we really need to get more finely grained on that. And that's what we're hoping to do. And that's what we're going to do when we hire a design consultant. Thank you. Rob, did you have your hand up? You're good. Okay. Um, the next we have uh, Susanna. Uh, state your name and address again. Hi, Susanna. Hi, Susanna Mosprat, 38 North Prospect Street. How are you doing? Hi, um, I have two questions and I haven't been quite as up on apartments as some of the other things that I'm following. So pardon me if I'm asking dumb questions, but I notice in looking at the actual text, which Maureen hasn't shown us tonight, that the clause about management plan has been taken out of uh, both, I believe both the apartments and the mixed use. And I wondered why. That's one question. Shall I ask my other question now? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, trying to understand. Um, we've been looking at the designs for 11 East Pleasant and the developer keeps trying to uh, reduce the amount of uh, retail space because he thinks retail is not is dead. Um, so could he bring that same design back as an apartment building with a few more apartments in place of the retail? All right, so um, those two questions, Chris, please. So the first question about the, uh, the text about the management plan. A management plan is now required, and it wasn't in the past, but it's now required for all special permits and all site plan reviews. And that's a requirement of the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board. So we didn't think it was necessary to put it into the zoning bylaw because it's absolutely required unless someone asks for a waiver. And I think the Planning Board is familiar with that uh, requirement. Um, as far as the designs for one, 11 East Pleasant, actually the developer has expanded the amount of retail space that he has in his latest plan. Um, I, I know that. Yeah, so, um, so and, it's, and it's more than some of the other mixed use buildings around town. He's got 2,200 square feet. Um, other buildings have much less than that. You will be hearing a presentation about mixed use buildings from, um, I believe Nate Malloy will give that presentation. And he's gonna talk about the ratio of of um, non-residential space to residential space on the ground floor of mixed-use buildings, and that may um, help to. Uh, yeah, that's our next. That's our next topic. Thank you, Chris. And from uh, we have two more, and then Doug. Uh, let's get the let's go through the public review here. Um, Hilda, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I. I wanted to speak a little bit about the apartments and a little bit of history. Um, Cause I know this town as I have a freshman at Mount Holyoke in 1954. So I know this town all through the fifties and sixties when we had a vibrant downtown full of little stores where everybody shopped. And now if you go down route nine, even through the pandemic, and looked at the number of cars parked in all of those Hadley parking lots, including where the five guys are and, 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 the, and the yellow bean and all that. Every time I've drive, driven by there, no matter what time of day, that parking lot is full. So the whole business of retail for somebody to say that I can't afford to put retail in this building because I can't rent it is hard for me to believe. I think that has to do with the rent structure or something else. But to get back to the, the apartments, why we built what we did. All right, so I left Mount Holyoke and I went to Columbia to graduate school, lived on 120th Street, Amsterdam Avenue, two blocks away were Mitchell Lama affordable apartments. This is 1958, 59, 60. They had just been built. There were two styles apartments. There were high rise, and there were three-story low-rise buildings. Well, guess what? The people in the three-story low-rise low buildings with, with outdoor places to walk and congregate, they all knew each other. And they took an ownership 
wall with regard to their units and kept it looking nice. And the high rises, I hate to tell you the stories I would hear of garbage thrown out the window, peeing in the hallway. I mean, every, because people did not feel an identity for these high rise buildings. Well, guess what happened? Around 1965, UMass built a high rise and a low rise Southwest complex when all the sociologists were studying these Mitchell Lama apartments in New York. And they says low rise garden apartments make people identify with their rental units as home. And they, they take pride in the building and they take care of it. And so just about that time, there was a lot of hard money with no money down and the developers came in and because we had such a vibrant downtown, a place where you could get the most number, biggest bang for the buck was to put it in the cornfields off, off South East Street or um, beautiful meadows up here in North Amherst. But at the same time, part of that history was that Alan Torrey, who was the manager of the time, made sure that there was a sewer line on the west side of town, but no sewer line on the east side of town so that there would be no apartments in the, in the South Elmhurst Common. And that, that's a true story. And so basically, if you're talking like village center, I'm thinking up here in North Amherst, I don't think we want buildings that are five and six stories high. I think that the, the, the apartment, garden type apartments where people, which actually could also be sold as, you know, starter houses, which is where we really need middle income housing in this town. We're taking care of the the rental, but people who want to come and buy here on the 200 to 350, there's nothing for them to buy to get a foot in the door on, on, and I think this is a little bit what Gordon Green was talking about in terms of getting a foot in the door and getting some equity to buy a house, um, a, you know, small garden apartment condo type things are, are, are a good thing to encourage. All right, thank and you. So, I guess my, my question was, does the 20 foot separation between the buildings still hold? It was 24 units in a maximum in a building 20 feet apart. Does that still hold? Yeah, yes, the, uh, I believe that's part of the definition. Uh, I would let Rob Moore answer that. So the, the definition um, under 12.02 apartment of residential use consisting of one or more buildings, each building containing no fewer than three, no more than 24 units. The proposal is about the cap. Uh, apartment dwelling units may share internal access ways and entrances and need not have separate exterior entrances on the ground level. Um, I think maybe your question about the distance between buildings may be a building code or fire code uh, question. I don't know. Yeah, Rob, do you have anything on that? Uh, there, there can certainly be distances required by the building and fire codes, but there are also ways to deal with that through the type of construction. So, um, you know, otherwise, by the definition, there isn't any other separation required. Great. And Thank also, you. Also, Hilda, um, uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, comments about your experience living in New York. Um, that is all very fascinating in context of planning history of these very high rise buildings. We're talking, you know, 30, 50 story buildings. We don't allow uh, those uh, in Amherst. And, um, you know, the I'm looking at the table three chart right now and the only zoning, the in the BG zoning district, we allow up to five stories and um, all the other uh, zoning districts that allow apartments are two and a half, or I would say three is, is the average. Um, and, and, and there are no, there are no zoning districts that allow four, uh, four floors. It's uh, five uh, for BG and the rest are uh, three and then it gets down to two and a half. So great. Um, we have uh, one more public comment here from Janet Keller. State your name and address, please. Hi, Janet. 
Hi, um, everybody. Janet Keller, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. I'm looking at the Amherst Preservation Plan. I'm recalling, I don't remember them all, but um, uh, am I correct that three of the village centers are North Amherst Village Center, East Village, mm -hmm. and Pomeroy? And um, any chance you could tell me what the other ones are? Um, and the reason I raise that question, um, oh, Cushman Village is also one. I'm remembering that now. Um, a number of these are National Register Historic Districts. And you are proposing, if I understand you correctly, to allow apartments uh, that could be as big as the buildings downtown um, or bigger, um, and uh, that you uh, are removing requirements. Um, so uh, how many of these are historic village centers? And um, I think you ought to put back the protections for these. Um, they are not, many people think they're protected because they're national historic register districts, but, but they're not. Um, it, it, yeah, maybe Chris can uh, respond to that. I, I think. Well, I'm very concerned about this and um, I, I would like a response. Thanks. Thank you. Chris? Who do you need to respond? So there aren't going to be buildings built that are as big as the ones that are downtown in the village centers because <clears throat> the village centers have a limitation of three stories and you have to get a special permit if you want to go beyond three stories. Also the property uh, sizes in the village centers are are not large and um, in order to have enough um, land area to build a really big building you have to have a larger piece of land. So each um, district has a requirement for um, the the first uh, the first requirement is for lot area for the parcel itself and then for each dwelling unit that you add beyond one dwelling unit, you have to have X amount of square feet of lot area to accommodate. So um, I don't think that the fear of having really big buildings in the village centers is a, is a well-founded fear. It's, um, if you take a look at the dimensional table and you can call me tomorrow and I'll run through it with you, but it really does limit the number of um, units and therefore the size of buildings and the height of buildings. Thank you, Chris. So uh, Janet, I see you have your hand up. You want to make a quick statement, but uh, I think we're about done here. So so, so I had um, additional questions um, and also a suggestion that we, the planning board um, do some site visits to the different types of apartments we have apartment complexes. We have the very big and very new Aspen Heights. And we have a bunch of smaller apartments that are like six units. Um, and sort of just to look at them in terms of design scale, the livability and amenity. So I think that would be good to kind of look at Aspen Heights and say that could be the future or even one East Pleasant Street. And so that's, I think that would be a good, uh, that's my recommendation for the planning board to um, do some, some street viewing. Um, I have another list of questions, um, and so I, should I just hold them for our public hearing? Yeah, I mean, I think the public hearing, if, if okay, we're, we're not, to... we're not, we're not going to be in a time limit, <laughs> and we're going to be very thorough, and, and this is just an initial brush to get the major points, uh, and I see Doug's hands up here, um, and then Nate, you're on deck with multi-use buildings uh, within a couple minutes here. Doug, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just had a thought that if Janet or others have a lot of questions and that many of them might be able to be answered by staff, uh, she and others could email them to Chris and Chris could get answers to those questions uh, outside of the hearing process so that we're fully educated when we get together for the hearing. Thank you. Good suggestion, thank you. Uh, with that, Nate, I think, uh, did you have something on the apartments? Yeah, hey, thanks. I was, um, what I was going to say is that Aspen Heights isn't a representative project because it's 
you know, it was a non-conforming use. So I think I would, you know, staff could generate um, a list of apartments that were permitted as apartments, not, you know, a pre-existing non-conforming that, you know, so Aspen Heights was a pre-existing non-conforming that then was able to enlarge, you know, the, the building footprint through, um, through zoning that way. It wasn't, you know, a brand new apartment building that was proposed as an apartment. So as, to me, to me, like Aspen Heights wouldn't be, uh, you know, an, a product to use would be like, you know, maybe at South Point where they added a new building or, you know, we have a list of other apartment buildings that were permitted, but I think the special permit uses like that are a little different. Good, good. All right. Hey, so Nate, don't turn your audio off because you're, you're on, you're uh, on deck here. So uh, let's sure. move on to mixed use buildings. Um, continue discussion about the proposed changes to the mixed use buildings, section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw, definition standards and criteria. Sure. Is, is my screen visible for everyone? Yes. Yes. Sure. Great. Thanks. So, you know, there is an existing um, section in, in the use chart 3.325 that um, you know, has standards and conditions for a mixed use building. And, um, you know, there is really no definition. And so, you know, this is something we've seen. Um, the, we're proposing, a, you know, to have uh, new conditions in the, in the mixed use and the mixed, um, for mixed use buildings in the use chart, and then a definition. So there'd be a definition in Article 12, and then standards and conditions for uses on the first floor, um, you know, bedroom count and, um, design review principles, they apply as part of a site plan review use anyways, but um, as Maureen had said, some of the conditions would also make it consistent with apartment buildings. So the zoning between those two buildings would be, would be similar. Uh, the new definition in article 12 would be a mixed use building that contains one or more dwelling units in combination with permitted non-residential uses. So um, the significance here is that, you know, non-residential uses is not just retail, it's any other uh, use allowed in the district in the in the use chart. Uh, the standards and conditions, it's something that we've discussed. So on the on the first floor, there's a maximum of 60% of the gross floor area on the first or ground floor could be used for residential use or enclosed parking. Um, so that's a maximum. And then a minimum of 40% would be the non-residential use, including um, you know, incidental or associated uses. So this is a minimum. So someone could elect to do you know, more of the ground floor, first floor being commercial retail or other non-residential use. Um, you know, and we're doing this incidental space. It's something that's typically in a bylaw because, you know, it can be storage, stairways, elevators, a number of things can add up um, as part of the space for some of these uses. So if you had, you know, bicycle storage or um, closet space or lockers. And so uh, it's something that is typically included as part of the gross floor area calculation. Examples of non-residential uses, it's retail, it's business, it's institutional, it's government, public service, uh, consumer service. It allows for, um, you know, in our, in our bylaw, there's things for entertainment um, uses, restaurants, you know, office space, um, lawful accessory uses. So, um, you know, I think that adds a lot more flexibility in terms of what the future holds for, you know, downtown shopping and, and businesses. Uh, the proposed standards and conditions you know, we've removed any design guidelines from the standards and conditions. So we're not getting into, you know, facade treatment or um, necessarily scale of building. Uh, we're saying that, you know, dwelling units and enclosed parking on the ground or first floor need to be located at the rear of the building and designed to be, um, you know, reduce visibility from the public way. Uh, we have um, a way to address sloping lots or lots of mul multiple frontage, you know, so if it's on a corner, um, the permit granting authority has the ability to determine what is the first or ground floor and what's the frontage. Um, again, the, uh, you know, the bedroom count is now similar to apartments. And um, the design review principles apply. Um, you know, we're saying that the, the planning board or permit granting authority always has the ability to refer an application to the, to the design review board. And um, you know, site plan review 11.24 includes the design review principles as part of the review of a project. So. Um, it's not part of the language, but it's something that's always there for a board to use. And an example that uh, Maureen developed, um, this is the uh, site um, where the Bertucci's building is located here. Here's East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Park is across the street, and here's Triangle Street. And so, you know, there was a proposed development on this site and, you know, this development is saying, okay, if there's a, a large building with, you know, the yellow A is retail or non-residential use, 
B is residential, uh, C is parking, and D is, you know, kind of um, the elevator, core space, stairwell, you know, what, what percentage does, um, you know, if we calculate the building size, what percentage is each of these uses? And this is an illustration showing that what 40% looks like, you know, on a, on a ground or first floor. So what, you know, what that split would look like in this type of development. Um, and, you know, I mean, it would look different, you know, depending on how they wrap it, but, you know, the 40% is, you know, it can be manageable. Um, you know, this is the next two slides just are a reference to, you know, the town hired uh, PVPC to do an economic development impact assessment uh, of town and what, what kind of retail, what kind of commercial, um, kind of what's the economic viability of uses in town. And it did find that, you know, this is town wide, granted it could be centered in different uh, village centers, but that the town can support a number of different uses, you know, whether it's clothing stores, boutique shops, uh, different retailers. And so I know that the, you know, retail is changing, but, you know, we were using this as a reference um, to say that, you know, there is, um, you know, there is the opportunity for new uses downtown. And so uh, without having to, you know, define a mixed use building as purely retail, we're leaving it as non-residential to help with that. So, you know, we can't anticipate what may come downtown, you know, if there's more live music venues, billiards or different experiential uh, opportunities. I know the bid is saying that they, you know, they think of downtown as being, you know, people come for an experience now. So, you know, that may mean different types of non-residential uses. I was just going to also share quickly the language just so, um, you know, everyone can see that, um, you know, I think the, there was a memo included in the packet. And so really what we're doing is we're not changing how it's permitted in any districts. So mixed use building is still, you know, by site plan review in many of the village centers um, and by special permit in the residence village center. We're not changing that. We're removing all the standards and conditions that are currently in the, um, in the use chart. You know, one is a requirement of a management plan. And as that has already been said, that's already a requirement in the, um, you know, in, in the permit application for both planning board and uh, zoning board. And then we're adding these, you know, just, you know, these conditions right here, the 60% a maximum for non-residential, a 40% for, um, um, I mean, 6% for a uh, combination of residential parking, 40% for non-residential, the parking and closed parking condition, uh, the sloping lots, and then the bedroom count. So those are the new standards and conditions proposed. And then the definition you know, one or more dwelling units in combination with permitted non-residential. So that, that is the entirety of the language, you know, before it had been much longer. So this is the new, um, you know, the new zoning. And that, that's, that's it. Uh, Thank you, Nate. Um, and I, I don't really have any questions right now, although I, I just, <laughs> I, I know the, the, the buildings that we have seen, um, the larger ones anyway, um, you know, are not meeting that 40% and they're right. yeah, pushing so back. Right, in uh, the packet here, there, you know, uh, in the previous pages, you know, in the memo, um, you know, it did mention a number of projects where the percentage of non-residential, you know, it varies from anywhere from like, you know, 10% to, you know, a little over 40%. So many of the new projects aren't meeting this 40%, agreed. Okay, well with that, um, Janet, you, you've had your hand up. Um. Thank you. Um, so I think that, you know, this, I feel this article is, I think getting very close to being done um, and because we've talked about it a lot. And um, I did ask Christine Brestrup to include in the packet, the previous, um, the 2016 yep. revisions that went to town meeting. And I thought um, where, it was, where the, Planning board, the planning department, the select board, all argued in favor of a 60% um, non-residential minimum. Um, and so, um, and I did listen to the part of the town council meeting. There was a lot of pushback by the town councilors against against the 40%. Um, and I remember Steve Schreiber saying, you know, just because one, you know, downtown building wasn't able to fill one shop doesn't mean that we should, you know, you know, give up this idea that of having ground floor retail businesses of all types on the first floor. And um, so I think that's our big issue for tonight. I do have some um, 
a, I, that's one big issue I think we should talk about. I know we were having a really good discussion of that. The other one is what happened to Project Open Space? Like, why did that disappear? It seems like every time, you know, the planning department goes to the CRC, you drop off some design standard or some kind of idea that you thought was a good one. And so, you know, did you change your thinking? Or are you just responding to the CRC? Um, at the last meeting, Doug was talking about maybe a setback from the street instead of the project open space. I would suggest 20 feet from the curb because that kind of gives enough public sidewalk and enough space for um, good amenities. And then I do have some questions about specific language that's kind of nitpicky, but I really do think we should recommend that um, the town council or this be amended to require 60% not in residential space. Um, it will keep spaces open for businesses, professionals. Um, it will keep the village centers and the downtown as a destination for visitors. If there's gonna be reasons to go there. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, in, in, in near my house, you know, I um, mean, what we call now called East Village, there's 37 small businesses that are all functioning without any retail residential space above. They're small shops, they're all in the game. And we need to keep spaces for them downtown and other in the village centers, because if there's no spaces, those spaces will become increased. What is there will become more and more expensive. So I think we should just stick with the recommendation from 2016. I'm very interested in what my fellow planning board members think. Thank you, Janet. Doug? Well, since I was the one that said at the last uh, planning board meeting where we discussed this topic that I didn't think it was ready for town council, I guess I feel the need tonight to say that I think it, I think it, it probably is ready. Um, you know, the, the concerns that I had earlier had to do with uh, some of the dimensional uh, requirements, including the project open space and some of the, the uh, things about locations of bicycle racks and, and entrances maybe to residential areas. So all of that has been removed and this has become similar to the apartment uh, proposal, much more modest and more focused on really more explicitly defining what a mixed use building is. Um, and I think that's a good step. It's an incremental step. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on board. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have uh, Tom and then Andrew. Sure, thanks, Jack. Um, and I, you know, I tend to agree um, in this case with Doug um, in terms of this being revised and all the reasons that um, I think he articulated go for both apartments um, and for mixed use that we are removing some of those, let's say prescriptions for what the building should look like and how it should be positioned to, um, uh, I think as Maureen noted, um, something that's zone or district based uh, as opposed to building typology. Um, and I think it's more appropriate to think of how a building sits on a site and what kind of open space it needs based on where it is and not so much on what building type it is. So I think that that change um, is helpful in getting this through, but I do think we do want to address that and whether that's part of our design consultants who are coming in to help us set some standards um, for those things in the future. I do think they need to happen, uh, but I don't think they need to be uh, embedded in these two articles that we're, um, we're reviewing today. Thank you, Tom. Andrew? Yeah, I, I, I agree with some stuff Tom, <coughs> excuse me, Tom and Doug said. I think, Janet, your question about, you know, what some of your peers think about the ratios. I mean, I would love to see it higher. I think like just in, in practice, it would be lovely if all the ground floor was dedicated to, to retail, which I think is really important. I'm, I'm not as concerned when I consider, first of all, I, I'd like the example that was shared, right? Um, that, that really demonstrated how that 40% could deliver a, a very vibrant street front, um, depending on how it's configured. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that having a minimum of 40%, which addresses the non-residential would get us to a point that once you balance out retail and other incidental and associated like parking, 
that in practice, it's going to feel like it's more um, non-residential than residential. So I, I think the math, when it's actually applied, will will yield a result that's more in line with what you're hoping for and what I'm hoping for. I do think that example was really useful to, to help me um, to envision that. Thank Thanks. you, Andrew. Uh, Maria, please. And that's a good point, Andrew. I think that uh, the 40% is a good place to start. Let's not make it uh, a big sort of hurdle right off, you know, right from the start. I think let's, let's, I think uh, as we've been presented a lot of these bylaws all spring, it's basically like, let's see how this works and we can come back and revise if we see there's issues or a lot of um, property owners are having issues with, you know, meeting these standards. But I think that's a great point about just, you know, that example that was shown that 40% um, is great for addressing the street frontage. Every site's going to be different. So, you know, like for example, the 11 East Pleasant one um, definitely doesn't have that, but doesn't make sense to do that. Um, I think someone brought the, the point about, you know, you could have retail not on the street front and could kind of go toward the back of a site, which is definitely possible. But I say, let's just leave it where it is and push this forward. Um, I feel like it's the same bylaw we've seen in the past. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. This has been a long problem we've had with just not having a definition for mixed use. So I think this is great and um, so we should just push it forward. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Janet, uh, so you have I, something what, else? Yeah, one thing I forgot to say, it was a question I have is like, what do other towns require, you know, percentages of spaces on the first floor? I know this question was asked on the mass planners listserv and Watertown said they only allow 15% residential on the first floor. And they have a pretty vibrant um, commercial like first floor life. You can see that town has really been cooking. So I'm wondering if the planning department looked at other towns to see in cities to see what, if they have a percentage requirement. Yeah, thanks. We have, and I think, you know, it, um, it varies, right? Some, some don't allow any, um, you know, and I think it's really, it can also be uh, some communities then regulate it by district uh, and try to get more detailed, you know, if a mixed use building is allowed in one section or another. I think, you know, I've also spoken with the bid and, you know, they, you know, um, they haven't formulated an opinion, but, you know, they were saying that the 40% uh, could be feasible, but in many instances, it might not be depending on how, right, the shape of the lot and access from different sides, you know, the proportionality of frontage to depth could be an issue. Um, so, you know, currently there is no definition. So we, you know, there could be, you know, it could be 95.5. And so the 40-60 is better. I think, um, you know, I think the 40% is still allowing enough flexibility that it's a non-residential use. So it's not just commercial or retail. So, and it is a minimum. So if, a, you know, if an applicant has um, an idea of how to have more office space, we're also allowing these uses on the second and upper floor. So we're not saying that the upper floors uh, are only residential, we're just saying this is the prescription for the first floor. So, you know, an upper floor still could be all office space if there's demand for that. And so we're not, we're not saying no to that. We're just saying what has to happen on the first floor and how it's oriented to uh, the public way. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we, there's a whole range of percentages. I think for Amherst, we're saying 60-40 for a mixed use building um, is good right now. You know, and if, uh, I, I think that if, um, you know, after time, this seems like we're getting, you know, different opinions on that. It can almost also be re-examined, but I think that it's, um, for many of these buildings, it's, you know, that for many new buildings, this is actually more than what they put in. So this would actually require, you know, a whole new thinking in, in site planning and building planning. Great. Um, one more thing, Janet. So could you, so you said you do know what other towns do. So I wonder, can you just provide that to us before our hearing or at the hearing that, we, you know, like, you know, if Watertown is 85% um, non-residential on the first floor, you know, what are the different towns and cities? Like what does Northampton require, you know, Brookline, let's just, you know, get a good sense of what's out there. Yeah. Um, I also think that the context of their, their retail market and their business market. So you know, I think the concern would be if we say we require, we say, oh, well, everyone, some communities say the whole first floor has to be retail or non-residential. 
that may be such a high bar that no one actually proposes any mixed use buildings. And so I think the concern would be that we would have a percentage that is not feasible to be constructed. And so, um, you know, that would either, you know, some people might think that's a good thing because then you're deterring development. Um, and, you know, my thought would be then we're actually, you know, it, it would be something that we'd have to re-examine. And so I think 40%, uh, like I said, would actually cause the developers that have been proposing buildings to actually rethink and change their, how they're designing now. And so I know what, you know, I, I think right, I looked at Brookline, I looked at Cambridge, we looked at Northampton and other communities, but their market and their contexts are so different that I think it's hard to say, okay, well, let's do what Brookline does um, without trying to cater it to Amherst based on, you know, some of our market conditions. And so, you know, we think 60, 40 is a good split right now. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up briefly, but you're good. I'm good. I just wanted to mention that Nate looked into Northampton. He did discover that 100% of the ground floor needs to be non-residential, but then he and Rob and I had a discussion today about the fact that there's a lot of open um, non-rented space on the ground floor of mixed use buildings in Northampton, even including some of the newer ones. So it looks like they're having a hard time renting that ground floor space. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely nervous about you know, <laughs> new empty uh, spaces and, and the affordability of uh, who's going to be, a, be able to afford, I know, the particular retail units that are offered. Um, so uh, Andrew and Maureen, well, I'm sorry, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I just wanted to say something that is um, that I feel like I should say as I'm the staff liaison to the Amherst Disability Access Advisory Committee and I often hear in, in meetings and, and I am happy to have this specific conversation with them again, is that um, persons with, with mobility issues that require wheelchair, uh, wheelchair specifically um, prefer to be uh, reside on the first floor. They don't want to use an elevator. Um, they um, have we have had several long discussions about this of losing electricity, uh, a fire, uh, if there's a fire, if there's a fire um, test, um, that there is, um, you know, they need fire persons to carry them down the, the stairwell. Um, and there's a lot of uh, anxiety and uh, frustration about where a, a fully ADA accessible uh, units are located. So I, I just wanted to say that, 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 that uh, when uh, we did create that sort of mo that concept floor plan, uh, I uh, envisioned that those could be two perfectly well-sized ADA uh, units. Um, so I just, I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Maureen. Um, and Andrew, and then we'll go to public comment. Thanks, uh, Maureen, that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. I, I had not thought through that. Um, that's, that's excellent. Um, let's see, I, I do think that to, to Janet's question, I think it'd be useful to have those as data points, Nate, like just what those percentages look like, not to say that we're gonna emulate those, but just there are additional data points, help us understand the guardrails. Um, I, I'd be interested in seeing that too. It doesn't have to be exhaustive, but you know, a, a smattering of other across the community. And then I was just wondering um, for 11 and uh, East Pleasant, if anybody remembers what the ground floor square footage is um, and what 40% uh, uh, applied to that would look like, whether that, you know, and I, I don't recall it going up to 2,200 square feet. Does that move us even north of 2,200 square feet if you apply 40%? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, the, uh, you know, right now they're at, they're, I don't know, between 10 and 15%. So. Uh, if we did the forty percent, that would, um, you know, get them over. I think closer to three thousand uh, square feet. So, okay, great, thank you. Um, I think we're good. Okay, so we can open up to call, uh, public comment. <laughs> and uh, Kathy, uh, hi, Jane? Kathy. And state your Hi. name and address. Hi. Uh, 
Kathy Shane, I'm at 519 Montague Road. Um, I'm just speaking as a resident, not as a council member. I just, I have two questions um, rather than comments on the um, percentage of, I don't know what the right percentage is. So I do have the question Janet said in 2016, the proposal was 60% non-residential, now it's 40. So my question is, do we have any examples where someone put a low number on the book and went back and put a bigger number later. So when we say it's incremental to put start somewhere, um, I could see starting with 50 or another number and lowering it over time, you know, as buildings came in. So that's just a question. Because um, once these buildings get built, um, it, we're not going to go backwards. And particularly where they're being built, um, there's not a lot of land for new buildings. So I think we're talking about a long-term future rather than just a first step. So that's a question. Then my other question, um, I had seen this discussion about uh, some public space um, within the definition of mixed use. So I'm wondering whether um, while thinking of mixed use or anything else in BG, should we start thinking about the setback from the curb? Because my understanding of setback right now, it's from whatever the, where the property line comes and where the current sidewalk public way is. And that's so variable. What I've seen in lots of codes and the smart growth codes measure it from the street. And Chris, you had mentioned this in um, one type of starting to think. And right now, BG, as you know, it's zero to 20. So it could either be none or 20, but it's measured from, so if it's a big wide sidewalk like Hastings, zero doesn't look so bad. You know, that's the public way. It's the problem when it gets narrower. So would, would one want to start looking, um, when I'm looking across these, um, there's all sorts of variation going across each of the zones but the big multi mixed use has been um, so far in BG. Um, up here, mixed use, we have a new development, a big one that people are very excited about, the Beacon, it's mixed use. And pretty much all the first floor is uh, commercial, not all of it. And it hasn't been rented yet, um, partly COVID and partly as everyone here has talked about the rents for new commercial space, retail space, tend to be higher than the type of places you want to have move in. And, and they don't have the ability to cross subsidize with the apartments up above because they're owned differently. So just that up here, the issue would have been the setback from the street, because again, the existing public way was very narrow and it was an industrial use. So we didn't start the building back very far. And so just thinking about it in the future, and I would say it in general for apartment buildings too, we have very narrow streets in a lot of old fashioned airmers that never envisioned a lot of cars coming back and forth and starting to think about how far back from the street, particularly if we wanna add a sidewalk later. And I sent some code in where other towns have done this. They call it, you know, they embed, it's not just streetscape, but they embed, they call them inadequate streets. They're really tiny. They barely fit two cars and start the building back further. So that would help in BG if the building wasn't special permitted, but you just measured it from the curb. So that's, both of those are questions, you know, that do you ever go backwards? If you said 40 is a good place to start, could we ever have 50? <laughs> As, and then my very last comment, um, Rob made a comment on what is non-residential. I really like the list of things that were there, food stores and or, or Nate did. And I'm wondering if you should write in specifically what's meant by non-residential. So later you're not confronted with, um, is the elevator that goes upstairs non-residential or is that part of the resident? Is the office rental office that's rental for the apartments, non-residential, you know, so have a list of what is included in non-residential and maybe have a, a list of what is excluded. Very, it's a little bit vague right now, but just be more explicit on what doesn't count toward that 40%. That's it. 
Thank you, Kathy. And we have, uh, oh, Chris, do you wanna, you wanna respond to that in any fashion? Okay. Um, Elizabeth uh, Veerling, please uh, state your name and address. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, um, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hey, thank you. Yes, this is Elizabeth Veerling at 36 Cottage Street. And thank you for uh, tonight's presentations. Um, I understand the, the desire to separate out the apartment definition, the mixed use definition from um, other requirements such as open space, et cetera, and that those should be included within the zoning districts. And this really just brings to my mind that how important it is and how linked these, all of these considerations are. So it's really critical to not forget what you've just defined as mixed use and as apartments when reconsidering how you define um, the requirements for open space, setbacks, et cetera, for BG, for BL, for any other district. So I just wanted to make that comment. All of these things are linked. So it's really critical to have a whole picture in your mind when, um, when discussing them. So you can't really understand the impact of mixed use or apartment requirements until we see how they sit on the zoning, uh, the rest of the zoning district bylaws. Um, and then I just wanted, so I just wanted to make that point. My other comment is I didn't feel that I got a good answer to a question posed earlier, which was with this new apartment um, definition, does that just mean that 11 East Pleasant could come back and say, well, we're just gonna be all apartments um, and forget being a mixed use building. So does it just mean that we're going to fill up the general business district with big apartment buildings? Um, is that just going to be allowed and we just won't even have mixed use buildings there? So that's, um, that was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Chris? Respond to that. I just wanted to say, in response to Elizabeth's question, um, that the applicants for 11 East Pleasant have put a lot of time and money into the design of their project. And so at this point, I doubt that they would switch to an apartment building in order to avoid um, the requirement for 40% um, non-residential space. And the other thing that we're proposing here Never mind. That's enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, Doug? I don't know. I, I, I suspect this is what Chris might have said, but isn't it correct that in the BG, uh, apartment buildings would now be only allowed with a special permit? Right, and that is the proposal. And that, that is a higher threshold of of a permission that's required. So it will still be more attractive to do mixed use buildings in the BG district. Good point. Good point, Doug. Um, so Janet, you have what about, what about else? Nate? Pardon me, and Nate, Nate first. Sure, thanks. I was just gonna say that in terms of mixed use buildings, um, you know, we're not proposing to change how they're permitted or their dimensional standards. So what we're you know, proposing are, is a definition and then standards and conditions to be used during permitting. So I know uh, Ms. Yearling had suggested, oh, well, we don't know what they would look like, but we're not saying that they have a different setback than they do now or height requirements or anything else. We're just, you know, we're looking at the definition and standards and conditions that are applied. So, you know, what's allowed now is what would be allowed with these changes too. So we're not changing, I just want to clarify, we're not changing any of those uh, pieces of it. Good. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Um, we have another um, yes. public uh, comment there. So uh, we'll, we'll get to you, Janet, after this. How's that? All right. Uh, so Susanna Muspratt, please state your name and address. Hi, Susanna. Hello again. I'm still living at 38 North Prospect Street. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I like Kathy Shane's uh, suggestion that you start high and come down because 
if you don't design the spaces to be usable for retail, they're not going to be able to be converted to retail, I don't think. Um, and you need a certain critical mass of retail. I mean, re some retail helps other retail survive. So we've lost so many businesses already. If they can be encouraged to design smaller spaces, maybe that is a way of pulling the rents down so that they're, you know, but more small spaces rather than one large space or flexible spaces that could be adjusted to different sizes. But I think we don't want to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Retail will be dead in Amherst if you don't have any spaces that retail can go into. Um, and, you know, we're coming out of COVID. This is not a forever situation. I think we don't know what the future holds, but I'd rather see us sound like a town that's open for business in that sense. Uh, than one that is only interested in housing more students. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. So we're um, ready for a, a break. Um, so uh, it's 825. And I'm not, uh, five minutes, I guess, but you know. Um, hey, Jack, just quickly, there's another hand raised after Susanna. I don't know if it's in relation to mixed use. Oh. Or not, yeah. Oh, Kyle. Hello, Kyle. State, state your name and address. Hi, it's Kyle Wilson from Archipelago Investments. How are you doing? How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, I have a two part question. Is the goal of this bylaw the creation of high quality street facing fully leased retail and restaurant space? And if so, isn't the most direct way of doing that mandating a percentage of street facing portion of the property to be non-residential rather than, rather than an overall percentage of the ground floor? Okay, that's, yeah. one, that's one question, do you have another? Yeah. It's a two part question. <laughs> you want this answered first? Uh, I'm just I'm 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 attempting to understand the 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 intent. Yeah. So thanks, Kyle. In it, it, it is saying that the non-residential has to be um, facing the street or areas customarily used by the public. I think the difficulty in saying um, a square foot or you know is it a depth off the street or depth in the building is you know we're not you know every use could have a different. Uh, footprint, right? So a certain restaurant may need more square footage for a full kitchen or storage compared to a retail. So to have a, you know, a square footed requirement could actually backfire. I think the 40% is a minimum, right? So anyone who wants to do more than 40% can do it. That's just, you know, we're saying that's the minimum non-residential space on the first floor. So if someone can line the street and have active streetscapes uh, and go over 40%, we, we welcome that. We're, you know, so we're not I understand what you're saying. I think the difficulty is trying to have um, some really prescriptive uh, measurements that may not fit for every building, right? So it's easier to do it as a percentage or a proportionality rather than just a, perhaps a square foot or something. I mean, I, I think there are probably other ways to approach it, but yeah. Kyle, do you have another question? Uh, no, I, I'm just attempting to ensure that in a town with very limited opportunity for mixed use buildings in terms of overall land mass, that where those opportunities occur, that this bylaw doesn't inhibit the creation of housing, which is a very large demand in our town and also ensures that the different locations can all um, accommodate a active ground floor street front. And I think that it all starts with the street and how do we accommodate the street and I think as much retail and non-residential as you can put towards the street is the is the solution. Thank you, uh, Doug. Well, I I guess I I, I view uh, Mr. Wilson's comment as kind of a direct follow-up to one of the comments he made when we were last reviewing his project, which. You know, he the, the 11 East Pleasant project 
ha has a very narrow footprint, very deep lot. So there isn't very much frontage uh, in comparison to the size of the lot. And he was concerned that something like a 40% requirement would result in a very, very deep uh, footprint for the retail, maybe deeper than is even, you know, optimal for a business use. And, um, but I, you know, I, I will say I, I can, I could view or I could entertain an alternative approach similar to what he's saying, uh, you know, with a minimum percentage of the street frontage uh, devoted exclusively to non-residential use. And then maybe, you know, we might think about uh, requiring the depth of the retail area to be some factor or multiple of the, of the width of the street. So, you know, whether it's 100% or it's 50% or it's one and a half times, I don't know. But uh, I mean, that certainly is another way to think about it. So uh, I'm not opposed to that, but, you know, Nate, I know you guys have taken the approach you've got. So, you know, maybe we need to give that a try. Good. Um, so let's take, oh, um, public comment. Okay, oh, I see uh, Dorothy. Uh, then Jennifer and then Hilda. Hi, Dorothy. Okay. Well, uh, I'll be following up on um, Kyle's comment with a suggestion I made earlier, which is uh, some kind of food establishment would be very well suited there. Um, and the thing about a food place is it can have a very narrow front, but it has to have the depth. It has to have the storage space, the workspace, the washing space. Um, so that could work there. I mean, you know, different businesses do do well in different kinds of spaces, but I know that many food spaces can have a very narrow front. Um, and because I had mentioned before that um, in the past there was, uh, I guess it's the, was it the Loose Goose? Um, it had a public, had a bathroom that it let people use who were using the park. And that what we have now is we have no, that all of those things are gone and, um, you know, would there be some kind of food establishment at that building that would have a bathroom that, you know, during during the daytime, of course, you know, they would let uh, park patrons or people come in to buy some food uh, use. So that could really help the whole thing in terms of the community feeling and the streetscape and um, serving the needs of the people. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, next, Jennifer Taub, uh, state your name and address, please. Hi, Jennifer. I didn't see the unmute button. Uh, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. Um, I was just, uh, I maybe asked a clarification or comment in response to what Mr. Wilson said, because it sounded like, which is what I think some of us really fear is an assumption that the business of Amherst is providing student housing. And the business of Amherst should also be businesses that serve the community, you know, retail community uh, facing, community facing businesses downtown. And at the point at which it's seen that the business of Amherst is providing student housing, because that's, I guess, what Mr. Wilson sees the greatest demand being, then our, our downtown really is doomed. And then I guess I had a question was, it was, is, was, were you discussing that if the, or was Mr. Wilson saying that if the businesses on the ground floor have to face the street then a building like 11 East Pleasant that's deep into the lot should only should be required to have smaller retail. Um, because it begs the question is maybe we shouldn't have buildings that go so deep in the lot and could then developers start designing buildings that only have a small frontage on the street to reduce the amount of retail on the first floor. So that's a question and a comment, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I, I think we're digressing a little bit in the 11 East Pleasant versus mixed use. I'm not sure this is appropriate. So let's, uh, Hilda and then um, Elizabeth, if you can kind of limit it to the bylaw and not, not Kyle's project. Hello, Hilda. I have, yeah, I had the um, 
this is Kyle's project, but but it it's also could be general. He has six units on the first floor on the south side of the building that face a garage. And then the other thing about that building is it's probably those six apartments are in shade most of the year because of the height of the building to the south of it. And so it seems to me one of those apartments, if not more of them, could be things that service the people who go to the park. It could be an ice cream shop. In fact, it could be a very large ice cream shop as, as Bart's was and would be, do a land office business. And maybe we ought to be thinking of, as long along with affordable housing, ways of affordable business space so that we can bring back the kinds of, of businesses that did very, very well. And, and I, I, I personally, I understand Maureen's issue of people who need have disabilities don't want to be carried down the stairs in a fire. And, but I don't think they would want to live in an apartment that looks into a garage that never sees sunshine. We've had enough of the month of July with no sunshine. Those people would be basket cases if they never saw sun from one month to the next. So I really, I, I see that distance between those two buildings as prime place for something like an ice cream shop. That would... Thank you. All right, thank you, Hilda. Um, Chris, your hands up. Yeah, I just really want to caution people just like Jack did against talking about that particular project because we didn't, did not have that particular project on our agenda tonight. Um, that's limited to the public hearing for that particular project. So I think you really need to limit yourself to talking about mixed use in general. And we're glad to have Mr. Wilson here because he brings the perspective of business to this discussion. And that's something that the town council has been encouraging and the planning, planning board has been encouraging us to talk to businesses but we don't want to steer um, into that particular public hearing pro um, process because that's an improper use of this of tonight's meeting. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder, Chris. So we have one more public comment and then we were going to close the public comment period uh, after this comment by Elizabeth Verling, please. State your name and address again. Hi, yes, Elizabeth Verling, 36 Cottage Street. And I just wanted to say that I'm sorry that my comment was taken as referring specifically to 11 East Pleasant Street. Um, I did not expect it to come back as an apartment complex. My concern was more that the next BG buildings could be strictly apartments. Um, and, and that this is where I wanted to say that it becomes an issue of what other requirements there are for the zoning district regarding parking, green space, et cetera, so that apartment and mixed use building outcomes are very closely linked to the underlying zoning district requirements and that's why we need to understand what we're doing with the underlying zoning districts while we think about these uh, mixed use and apartment uh, uh, bylaws. So I'm sorry that it was interpreted as just 11 East Pleasant. It was really more a comment about um, in general, BGO buildings becoming strictly apartments and again, that this is all related to the underlying zoning district requirements. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so let's take a break. I, I'm, I'm going to ask for a few more minutes, uh, like eight minutes or so, because um, <laughs> uh, we do have some more. I just want to get uh, refreshed here. So eight minutes, we'll see y'all. Uh, put your video off and put yourselves on mute.
Hey, Pam. Hi, Maria. Hey, can I ask? So while I'm away, I, you know, I probably have spotty Wi-Fi. So I was wondering if I call in and I'm just brought in as a phone call panelist, is that a thing or not? Yes. And no. I, I think, um, so when I post it on the website, I actually include international numbers. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so there's probably a, a different like phone number than you, that you would call. Mm -hmm. Um, like if you can give me a heads up that you're planning to attend, mm -hmm. I'll be looking for you, but also like raise, raise your hand and I'll be watching. Yeah. I mean, we we'll have a cell that's you, it has international calling plan, but it's just a local number. So I, I don't know that I would be, you know, it's just a local phone. It's just, I have an international service. So I'll, yeah, I'll, okay. I, I think that would be the best way for me to just like dial in and then I can email you the day before, or yeah, like you said, I can just mm -hmm. read my hand and just tell you mm -hmm. that normal time here. Cause yeah, if there are a lot of votes coming up, I, I feel like I, I, I would want to weigh in in real time and not just send a memo and then hope for the best. <laughs> so, okay. And then um, we'll just make sure that you get um, like my cell phone number and Chris's cell phone number and so if we're having any trouble, you can text us. Mm -hmm. I think I have those. You, you've sent out like a contact. I did. I did. So yeah. So if okay. you don't have that, um, zip me an email and I, I'll make sure to send sure it to you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because yeah, yeah. no, looking at, at the calendar and seeing what's coming up, it looks like every meeting is like, other than the CRC joint meeting, everything after that, I think there's a project or a, something being voted on. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that I'm committing to anything. I just, you know, I just want to make sure if I can, it's possible just to come in as a phone call panelist. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I must say I'm a little jealous. I've never been to Italy. Oh, and you I don't think it's this romantic trip we're going on. It's actually hard work. It's not like we're strolling through cobble streets, drinking wine. I mean, we're literally hiking for six hours up a mountain, you know, yeah, but, and <laughs> so like, to me, that's the beauty of it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not like the stroll and drink wine. I mean, I'll stroll for sure. <laughs> um, but like when I go away, and it's necessity so it's always low budget so i'm always looking for the state parks and you know the i, I tend to be a beach girl so i'm like okay where can i go to the beach for free and, and yeah. walk so yeah no i just i know a lot of people um who have been to italy or they that's on their bucket list and people oh. who have been are, you know they just have wonderful things to say Oh yeah, no, it's it's really great. It is. I'm not. I'm just saying that it's not like I'm going on a vacation. I'm, I'm literally going to like this um, horse fly infested campsite at the top of a six hour hike up a mountain, and then helping like. Um, well, this year we're short staffed. We don't. We're not bringing the college kids with us, so I probably will end up working a little bit with them, looking at flowers and moths. So sure. Well, I can't wait to hear about it when you get back. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I usually have some photos and stuff I can share here. Yay. All right, a travel log. Yeah. <laughs> Presentation. I love it. Yeah, we'll get that on the agenda. <laughs> uh, so are, are we have everyone except Janet. Um, hold on. Let me stop my screen share and I'll be able to see better. Janet is here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're, we, we're good to go, I think. Two, three, four, five, six of you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, you're good to go, Jack. You just need to tell okay. me, like, where you're, where are you headed? Yeah, well, we're going, uh, so we concluded um, discussion on mixed use buildings. And now um, yeah. we have next, uh, we're going to talk about the, the parking 
Okay. Uh, article and then a little bit about the BL after that. So um, the next item is proposed changes to parking section 7.00 general requirements subsection 7.000 of the zoning bylaw for dwellings, including mixed use buildings, apartments, and accessory dwelling units. And who from the department? It looks like Maureen. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Jack. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, before I get into the slides, just um, I would like to reiterate what Chris had said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you, so we were uh, originally thinking about um, making some parking amendment changes to the uses um, such as mixed use building apartments and the supplemental dwelling uh, apartments. Um, in, in those specific sections and, um, you know, after talking to staff and after attending planning board meetings and CRC uh, meetings, um, it, it, uh, everyone um, recommended to us that they would rather see uh, the parking amendment propose, proposals um, addressed in article seven, which is specifically for uh, parking. And so, uh, so tonight's presentation is, uh, is a proposal for article seven opposed to the individual use classifications. So um, the existing zoning language, um, and so, and they're just uh, uh, very, uh, the proposal is limited to uh, parking space requirements and nothing other than that. And so the current language in Article 7 says for dwelling units, including apartments, uh, two parking spaces for each dwelling unit is uh, required. And our proposal uh, breaks it down um, for parking space requirements for the type of residential uses. Uh, and so these uses listed here, one family, two family, a townhouse, and a subdividable or converted dwelling uh, dwellings are uses that we uh, to date are, have not studied uh, as part of our like 2021 zoning amendment proposals. So we're not, uh, since we're not studying these uses, uh, we don't want to delve into uh, making uh, parking ch changes related to these uses. So th for these specific uses shown here, um, uh, it would continue to have two parking spaces for each dwelling unit shall be provided. And so um, this just specifies those exact uses. And the next slide shows um, that the other part of the proposal um, talks about the, the uses that we are working on with, with you in the CRC. Uh, which is, uh, you know, obviously apartments, mixed use building, and the supplemental dwelling units. And for these, we're recommending that adequate parking for each dwelling unit shall be provided for each of these use classifications. And, um, and, and so the proposal goes on to, to provide specific criteria for both the, both the permit granting authority and for the developer to, uh, give, um, uh, to give specific criteria for um, determining what is adequate. Um, and so it is site specific, development specific, neighborhood specific. Uh, it's not just a generic number. Um, and so um, this paragraph or listing here shown on the slide gets into the specific criteria that either the planning board or the zoning board of appeals uh, would be um, requiring um, the applicant at hand to provide um, to, pro to provide as evidence of of of, um, of of the amount of parking that they're requesting. And so I'll just list off. Um, so such specific factors include the bedroom count in the development, analysis of a, analysis of traffic impact reports, the proximity and connectivity to, to downtown public transit, and or public parking, including on street and off street parking, availability of a alternative modes of transportation, ten uh, tenant lease restrictions uh, relative to parking and shared or, or leased parking. Um, and so the applicant would need to provide, you know, supporting evidence to, to support 
um, the amount of parking spaces that they feel is um, needed for their proposed development. And so I, I would say, um, you know, uh, I work with the Zoning Board of Appeals, so I, I can only, you know, give examples of, of my time with them in Amherst. And, you know, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals has, um, you know, required uh, housing uh, projects before them to provide parking spaces, uh, a parking space per bedroom instead of um, what um, the bylaw says, which is two parking spaces per dwelling. The board has sometimes goes above and beyond and says, no, we want a, a bed, we want a car per be uh, bedroom. And, you know, um, and, and so I, I think that the, the two specific examples that come to mind that, uh, that the board did um, require that they weren't near bus stops. They weren't near downtown. They weren't near, um, you know, opportunities for shared or leased parking. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, this gives uh, the discretionary power for the either board to determine what is at adequate. And so, you know, if it's downtown on a bus line um, that's in walking distance to shops and colleges um, and public transit, you know, may maybe the developer could add there is perhaps the bedroom count is mostly, you know, studio apartments or one, one bedrooms. Um, perhaps, perhaps it would be reasonable for the board to consider maybe one, one uh, parking space per unit. Um, and maybe even some of them don't um, provide parking spaces. And for those sorts of scenarios, and I think the planning board has dealt with this, um, where um, that an applicant um, did not provide parking spaces for every unit, or perhaps they didn't meet all the, the, the specific number that was required. You know, in those scenarios, there would need to be a condition of the special permit or the site plan review decision that um, gets into the tenant lease restriction and that would be, you know, part of the decision that is going to be recorded with the Registry of Deeds, um, and so that, you know, that developer would need to, um, you know, when they're signing off a lease with a, a with a prospective tenant, that that both the tenant and the um, property owner would would have that legal binding document that that the tenant would know, uh, you know, that they can't park there. Um, I also wanted just to mention that the um, Sean Mangano, who is the town's finance director, is creating a parking working group to uh, re um, to um, review the parking uh, implementation strategies um, that resulted um, in a report that was produced in 2019. Um, this report is on the town website, and I'm happy to email it to everyone. Um, and as part of that. Um, that report, there are specific, you know, goals and recommendations. And so uh, Sean Mangano and this parking working group will, will um, be reviewing those goals and, and, and finding measurable um, actions that they can take. Uh, for example, they will be looking at the parking permit system. We currently have the parking passes um, and to see um, how how that can be improved um, for residents and um, and, uh, and and instead and maybe increasing the the, the pricing of that um, and there's a, a a a whole host of other recommendations at, out of that report um, and so I think that was all I had so again the real premise of this is is that this this proposal is giving specific criteria for the permit granting authority to use um, as they review and deliberate on a decision. So it could be two parking, the board could say, you know what, we still want two parking spaces per dwelling. Or they could say, you know what, that made sense, you provided this evidence um, and you know, um, we'll adjust the, the number accordingly. So this just gives uh, the flexibility um, for the board to handle such things. And that's all I think I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I think um, in, the, in the projects we've seen in the last few years, 
it has been all over the map um, from Spring Street with zero parking to the recent um, collection of houses that are on College Street where they wanted, you know, one parking space per tenant. And, you know, I, and, uh, and I know that, you know, there's, uh, there's others besides Spring Street. I think the Perry Apartments on Amity have 32 apartments and they, they don't provide any parking and they have 100% occupancy. So, you know, this parking is just, uh, it, uh, it's all over the place in terms of where it could go and, and, and you know, what works for the town and all that. But um, that's, you know, my initial two cents. Um, so I think uh, Janet and then Andrew. Um, first thing I wanna say is that my comment during talking about um, mixed use and the brief time we talked about apartments was that I didn't think the use table was an appropriate place to talk about parking requirements. I certainly did not ask that the parking, that article, our parking article be amended or changed or that this um, language be brought to town council or worked on. I think quite the opposite. I think the language in here is very confusing and poor. Um, I think the distinctions between, you know, different types of multiple housing where some have to do two units and some are up for grabs, you know, as adequate. There's no data to support, you know, these, the, you know, like how would we decide? It's going to lead to longer and longer hearings for the planning board and inconsistent decisions. Um, and then we already have a parking waiver provision in the in the bylaw that we can waive requirements and it gives three different examples. If that needs to be clarified, we could do that in the context of that waiver. And also the planning board and ZBA can already increase parking using the different um, language in site plan review criteria and special permit. So I, I, I just find this whole thing just odd. Um, you know, I think we can take care of, I, I think that our bylaw already accommodates some flexibility, but it's not infinite. And it's not gonna ask every project person to come in and provide a, a data set to us and tell us, you know, what their tenants, this type of tenant will need this year. Um, I, I completely don't understand the distinction between apartments, mixed use and ADUs and why they have to have adequate parking versus duplexes, townhouses, converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings. These, both sides of that, both, you know, the ones that will be covered by adequate are multiple unit buildings. The ones that are gonna require to have two units are multiple unit buildings. I, I just completely lost on, you know, what, why would the needs of a tenant to park depend on whether their building was subdivided, converted, a supplemental unit in mixed use or one of 10 townhouses? I, I just, I can't fathom that. I don't, you know, if the planning board has been studying specifically the needs of tenants in apartments, mixed use buildings and supplemental units, please provide me the data. Um, I just don't, I just, there's so many things here I just don't understand. I don't understand what, how the planning board or the ZBA would be making decisions. Um, you know, what, do we have any data on local parking needs of tenants in different housing types? Um, so that, that's just my first, you know, foray, but I do think we really need data and data and data before we do any kind of manipulation of, you know, adding this to the, the parking bylaw. Thanks, Janet. What we do know is that apartments and mixed use buildings are allowed in zoning districts that are in our downtown and village centers that are on or adjacent or close to um, bus stops um, and are in walking distance to the university and downtown shops. Um, and um, since we are studying apartments and mixed use buildings, um, as well as supplemental dwelling units, uh, we felt that this was a good opportunity to address um, parking um, for these uses specifically and not sort of jump over to other uses that we're not spending any time um, at this moment looking at. And so I, I think that was the rationale uh, for this proposal. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and then Maria. 
Thanks, Jack. I, I, I also found this a little confusing and, and somewhat arbitrary in terms of where the distinctions were made. And then also just like adequate, the word adequate is one that I just have trouble grasping as well in terms of we've listed factors, which is, which is good, but I don't know that there's any real guidance on how those factors should be considered and, you know, whether or not, um, I guess would like some more direction as to if this particular metric is higher, we should have more parking. If it's lower, we should have less parking. Um, also, I, I think it might be useful just to, you know, as we're considering the amount of parking, um, I know there's some reference into like what materials should be used, but you know, the amount of parking is obviously gonna impact the impervious surface um, and, and as well as like the lot coverage. Um, so I, I think like some recognition of that in the criteria, I think it should be a consideration if we're gonna be um, playing with the number of parking spaces, we should have an understanding of, of how that might impact um, the overall, uh, the, the landscape. Thank you. Thanks. Maria? Um, so thanks Maureen. Um, oh, where was I going with this? Um, so, well, I, I understand why you left out the um, the single family duplex converted dwelling, and I forget the fourth one. It's because, like you said, you haven't studied that. Whereas we have been studying apartments and um, mixed use buildings, and so that's why the distinction of only addressing the parking for those types of uses, and it makes a lot of sense as well, just because we've had this issue over and over where the parking bylaw is this sort of dinosaur remnant. Um, it's something that we've seen doesn't make logical sense with today's sort of need to um, put people before cars and put sort of the idea of like being a little more conscious of like how much um, resources we use as far as just paving over real estate versus you know building housing, building retail. And especially for mixed use buildings that tend to be in the downtown areas and the apartments tending to be in the denser areas that are already built up, uh, giving up that much square footage for two parking spaces per dwelling unit has just come up over the years, over and over. And so I think what this is saying is basically, um, let's take each project and think about its location, its size, what its adjacencies are and develop the best solution. And of course, developers are gonna to try to, you know, squeeze out more rental space than parking, but then they also want it to be rented. So they're gonna figure out a good balance. They're not just going to, um, you know, they're gonna come up with something that will make their property leasable and rentable. So um, there have been examples where, yeah, there's no parking provided at all. And we'll see how that goes as far as what, what, what's going to be rentable or leasable, but um, I do think this this is a really timely bylaw that we've been hoping would come up eventually. Um, I, I think it was one of the priority items from from the CRC, like, um, but it certainly is something that we discuss a lot in a lot of our projects and over the years. And so um, I appreciate this coming forward. And um, it, I, I, I think we have been discussing it. It's just that we haven't been discussing it as a parking bylaw. We've just been discussing it as parts of other bylaw amendments we've been discussing. So um, maybe that's why it seemed like a surprise. But, um, but yeah, I, thanks for the work on this. And um, I guess, yeah, I've, I've uh, watched a lot of um, seminars during this pandemic and uh, uh, where it was all about affordable housing and how we um, bring more sort of affordable housing. And one thing is um, literally just to not require a lot of parking for every development because um, it's a pretty convoluted theory, but um, I should find the PDF again. It, it's basically that, you know, you're assuming everyone needs um, cars and, and assuming that everyone has two cars per family or, and a lot of the affordable housing is about um, be able to buy the property, build a house and build it just large enough for what you can afford. And then to require on top of that, to give up property to build parking spaces. You know, there are just, there's a lot of um, things that are just outdated about the, the two per dwelling unit. So 
I don't know what the answer is, but I, I feel like it, it, it needs to be something other than what we have right now. So um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of um, answer you come up with, I guess. But, um, but I think this one is a fair one. Um, it's what we're doing already, I feel like, as far as the planning board, I don't know about the zoning board, but um, we, we are doing a lot to sort of look at each property and each project and consider all the things that you just listed in the um, amendment. So, so thanks. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Chris and then Tom. Thank you. I just wanted to remind the board about the lengthy discussions we had about two recent projects. And one of them was at 462 Main Street, um, John Robleski's project. And the other one was um, Amir McChee's project on Southeast Street. And there was a very lengthy discussion about how much parking should actually be um, permitted or allowed or required there. And the things that the planning board considered are the things that were listed in this guidance that we put together for figuring out how many parking spaces are reasonable. And I remember we asked Mr. Robleski to come up with a plan that specifically outlined, you know, information about other parking, uh, other parking for other developments and, um, you know, information about buses and proximity to different things. And in the end, you know, all of the things that the planning board considered were things that are listed in this paragraph here. So that's why we thought you end up having this discussion anyway. Well, why don't we put the guidance in clear black and white language in the bylaw so you have the specific guidance right there in front of you. Thank you, Chris. Tom? Oh, uh, Maureen. Um, go ahead, Tom. Uh, Maureen yeah. had her hand up, but. Uh, okay. I, I mean, I was just going to say that I, I agree with um, the notion that parking is, is highly specific to a particular site and all the variables and conditions that are there. Um, and I fully agree that the approach should be to have it be a matter of discourse. What I'm missing from this is process. So are they proposing a certain number and then we're approving it or rejecting it? Or are we looking at a particular site and evaluating what we think it should have? I'm just curious about how we get to um, an agreement on a particular site or a particular situation and, and what that process looks like. I just don't see it here and, and maybe it could, maybe it's explained elsewhere. Uh, sure, no, that's a, gr that's a great Maureen. question, oh. Tom. Um, uh, what I would envision for the process is that you know, the, the developer is gonna go to article seven, they're gonna see, they're gonna see this language and as they're sort of, you know, they're doing, you know, apartment building, mixed use building, an office, something, uh, or actually only the three uses. So forget the office scenario. Um, and so they are going to um, look at this criteria and they're gonna, um, they're gonna figure out what, how many parking spaces they think they need and then they're going to provide evidence to the board that's reviewing their application, um, and the board will will evaluate the merit of that information, um, and uh, the board could and often will say no, uh, we don't like that. Uh, you know, sometimes that happens, and they say no, you're still going to have to add another parking space or. Um, and they, they do it for all other topics. But um, so I think it's a back and forth, um, you know, and, and the, the boards um, also have the discretionary power to get a peer review of, of, of data. If, 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 you know, if a board doesn't believe an applicant's, um, you know, evidence from a uh, parking consultant, um, you know, the, the board could certainly, uh, under Chapter 53G, could request a peer review, which means that a peer reviewer would review that consultant's um, documentation. Um, and so this is giving uh, specific factors for the board um, to look at when they're considering what is at adequate parking uh, spaces uh, for a specific development. One thing I was going to say um, that I particularly really like uh, about this, um, which is such a minor detail, but 
to me, it's very important is the language that says uh, proximity and connectivity to downtown public transit, public parking, including on street and off street parking. And the key word that I really like is this word, connectivity. So, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you, you might in your own neighborhoods um, notice that maybe you don't have a sidewalk or you don't have a crosswalk. Maybe the crosswalk uh, doesn't have a ramp that's ADA accessible. Um, and so if a developer is making this argument that is, you know, there is a close proximity to downtown, but unfortunately there's just no sidewalk, well, guess what? Maybe that developer is gonna put in a sidewalk for, the, for that development that's directly related back to that development. Um, and coincidentally, it's a benefit for the town, but it would be directly um, related to that proposed development at hand. And um, I, I think that that's a, a really good um, added um, part to this uh, zoning language, um, which could be really beneficial to um, perhaps many neighborhoods that may may or may not have adequate, um, you know, uh, sidewalks and curb cuts and, and, and the like. Thank you, that's a good, good example, Maureen. Uh, Janet? 462 Main Street had a came to us for a project that had two parking spaces per unit and we gave it a permit. And then at Southeast Street Commons, which has never been built, we allowed less than one um, parking space per unit. After that, Mr. Oblaski came back and asked for a bigger building with fewer spaces because he with fewer spaces, you can get a bigger building. And then, so we, you know, long discussion, we did that, very weak evidence um, of parking need or, you know, in, in, in the area or studies. And now Mr. Blasky is tearing down the original building and putting in more parking. And so um, I don't think we can keep on this path of every single planning board hearing a back and forth about the needs of, of you know, what they're providing, what's their studies, what their expert says. I think that makes the process worse and longer. I, you know, I wonder if Pam, you can pull up the waiver section of article seven, because if there's problems and lack of clarity in that, I would play with that language to make it clear. Um, you know, it, that section allows waivers under several conditions. Um, probably the one that we all argued about was um, 7.912. And to me, that focuses on do the tenants need parking? And it looks at a bunch of different factors about a management plan and how parking, you know, you know, transportation could get, uh, you know, provided to them in lieu of cars and parking. And so I think we can work within this language and adjust it, but I think it's really confusing to say a converted dwelling with three units needs two parking spaces, but an apartment with three units it needs to be adequate. And then we're gonna debate it and talk about it. I don't know why a supplemental unit doesn't necessarily can do adequate parking, but a duplex has to have two spaces per unit. I don't understand the logic of it. It seems in, insanely confusing to me. I don't think we have studied, you know, there are, apart, there are small apartments all over Amherst. There's many apartment complexes, you know, on a single bus line that doesn't go by very often um, in South Amherst. And so, you know, I think we need to study this issue. We have to understand what tenants need. It could vary by age, by being a student. It could vary. I mean, there's, there's, you know, what do the studies say are the factors? Income, low income people tend not to have cars, so they don't need as much parking. Um, it might be proximity to a food store. So I, I, would, I don't mind tweaking the parking bylaw and the waiver language. I just don't have a data set to base it on. I don't wanna, I don't wanna sit in hearings and hear it over and over and over again. And be, you know, once we decide, oh, you don't need parking, you don't go back from that. Usually you don't have more space. The other thing is I completely agree with Andrew. I don't even know what adequate parking means. I don't know. I was like, what does that word mean? What's the definition? I didn't understand how this new section would work with the waiver section. Does that mean adequate parking can be waived if that section's invoked? Um, 
can we now require parking in the municipal parking district because it's not adequate? Does that kind of supersede the, you know, section Article Three section about saying it's a no parking district? Um, you know, I just I just thought I just I just thought this was not ready for prime time in so many different ways. But I really want to know, and I want to know what other towns do. You know, I've looked at Chelsea, I've looked at Northampton. They look at units, they look at bedrooms, they look at districts, closeness to the MBTA, a huge mass transit system. You know, I just, this just seems, you know, I feel like this is really not ready. It needs a lot more study and research and it's not really a priority when we have, you know, 17 other zoning amendments to look at. I'm sorry, I've just said this big piece, but. Great, hey, um, I'm wondering, uh, Chris, um, would you be able to make some general comments about what um, some of the thoughts from the CRC are on this particular bylaw? Or is that, all, you know, is there a consensus all over the place? I'm just curious. Um, I don't remember the CRC having a lot of discussion about this. Um, Maureen was at the meeting when this was presented and maybe she remembers more specifically what the CRC had to say or what, or Rob may have some thoughts about that, but I don't remember the CRC being critical of this, of this section of the bylaw. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they, they had um, m much um, sort of concern that I'm hearing from some members tonight. Um, I do re recall uh, Stephen Stryber, uh, Town Councilor St Steve Stryber, talking about, mm, well, maybe, maybe could we look at minimum and maximum parking requirements? And uh, I remember thinking, well, that has some merit. And I actually did look into that. And, um, and so form-based codes, for instance, uh, they get into minimum and maximum requirements for, for you for uh, uses and, and zoning districts. And my one concern with that is they recommend that the minimum be zero and then you define what the maximum is. And I feel that that compared to the term adequate gives the board more flexibility to determine what that is opposed to a generic number. Um, and especially um, given that the board would be looking at specific factors um, and, uh, and uh, evaluating things that Janet brought up, you know, who, what is sort of the age demographics, uh, what's the sort of affordability rate, uh, is it close to maybe hopefully one day a, tr a train stop? Um, if that ever comes to fruition, is it close to uh, bus stops, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, is there uh, shared parking? Um, I, I do remember that CRC members um, really like the, uh, the language about shared and leased parking, um, which is a very common um, uh, parking model um, where you have um, multiple uh, developments um, share parking, um, perhaps a, a mid-block um, uh, parcel where they share it and, um, and coming up with sort of creative solutions to, um, to, um, to uh, locate parking. And so all those uh, listings of, 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 of uh, specific factors or criteria, um, th th those would have to be analyzed. And so, um, we're not saying zero parking spaces. We're not saying, you know, we're not saying a specific number. The, the The applicant would have to prove to the board what they believe is adequate and it would be at the discretion. And that's the unfortunate thing of the planning board and the ZBA is that I think kind of like an engineer. I wanna, I want, I want the number. I want, I want black and white answers. And the thing that the planning board and the zoning board of appeals uh, need to grapple with is that you have the discretionary power to make your decisions based on your specific findings. And so in, in a lot of ways, you'll see words in the zoning bylaw that are sort of up to interpretation. And so it's really up to the board 
themselves to to review the evidence and make your discretion and use your discretionary power to make your decision. Yeah, sort of like form. This is one of the more form-based zoning codes that are being proposed, I guess, with the bylaw revisions. Is that true, Maureen? Uh, uh, say that one more time, sorry, Jack. Um, just uh, in terms of the thought, you know, I, again, form-based zoning is, is um, you know, Maria and, and others have talked about it, and it's hard to kind of put your own, but it sounds like this bylaw is kind of embracing that you know, of, of all the bylaws that we're looking at. Yeah, um, no, I, yeah, absolutely. And I would say that that um, the, the parking implementation strategy report that, again, I'm happy to email. Some of the specific recommendations are also, um, you know, specific uh, recommendations for form-based codes. Um, and they're really good ones. And they're not necessarily even related to the zoning bylaw. You know, um, it, it, it goes above and beyond of, the zoning bylaw, which we getting into fees and, um, and and things like that, and and restructuring the permit systems and and, and providing better signage and um, things of that nature. Great. Uh, we have Doug and then Janet. Yeah, this this conversation is reminding me of my recent interview to be reappointed to the planning board. Uh, one of the questions that came to us uh, to Janet and me was how we felt about waivers and when they should be given and when they shouldn't be given. And uh, the gist of my answer was, is that we, we've, we will tend to give waivers when there's a problem with the underlying zoning. And, and the more waivers we give in a particular area of the zoning, the more likely it is that that zoning is broken. And so this change doesn't seem to me that it will really change our deliberations in any way, uh, because as uh, I think Chris pointed out, we've had these conversations about 462 Main Street and some of the other recent projects utilizing these same criteria that are proposed to be listed. But uh, I actually like this because it will, I guess I would say it will remove the stigma and the guilt that I will feel from giving waivers because somehow by giving a waiver, I'm, I'm undermining the, you know, the guidance that the town has given us. And, 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 and now you know, we can actually deliberate and we're taking away the kind of outdated requirements that uh, you know, we've had to live with. So that's my comment. Very good, thanks, Doug. Uh, Janet? Can we look at the waiver language in section 7.9 because we don't have to feel guilt when we apply very clear language and if there's some problem with the language we can tweak it and make it clearer but what we're really doing is we're going to take this whole section 7 article 7 and make it really murky and so if we can look at this language is there's three, they give you very specific times that you can give a waiver. One of them involves shared parking or people, you might have a parking lot and people are using it at different times of day. So, you know, so the tenants are using it at night and it's empty, that's a reason for a waiver, right? Um, you know, parking, peak parking needs generated by on site uses occur at different times, um, shared parking you know, a parking management plan that makes sure that the tenants can get places. And then of course, the one that Doug, um, the compelling reasons of safety aesthetics or site design. And then, you know, articles 11 for site plan review and article 10 for um, special permits make, requires us to make sure that the, the building works for the people in it. And so we could add parking if we need, if we see it, we needs more. Say there's undergraduates and they all need a car to get around. So I don't see what's the problem being solved here. The waiver, the waiver section gives flexibility. It gives a lot of very specific things. If you, if the planning department thinks that it wants to add some more criteria, let's work within the context of that instead of adding adequate to certain types of multiple multi-unit multi places, but a two parking requirement to certain 
other multi-unit multi buildings and then those are two units versus the adequate and then we can waive those and something happens to the to the no parking district because that language shows up too I, I i just don't i think this is really this is going to be a hard go and i just don't i just think this is really this is the kind of thing i would send to a pop-up zoning subcommittee to say like what's the problem being trying to be solved let's see what how the bylaw works and if we can tweak it without extensive changes yeah, so I just noticed, uh, well, uh, Maria, uh, please. Can we, but can so I think you hit the nail on the head, Janet. We're literally saying what in the bylaw needs to be fixed. It's the parking, the two unit, so two spaces per dwelling unit has been the flawed piece that we've been dealing with for, I can't remember how many projects now since I've been on for five years. Every time we look at a project where we look at what the parking was required and it's this huge number. <laughs> and then we look at the lot size and we look at how much square footage the building needs to have with the setbacks and the parcel size. That's the flaw. The flaw is the bylaw. That's what we're trying to fix now. Just take off the two spaces per dwelling unit and do what we're already doing, which is deliberating. I don't think right now we're here to solve what the numbers we're here to figure out whether this parking bylaw amendment is as Doug touched on something that's a, a contentious point that we keep discussing because it's 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 flawed. Um, that's why we've had so many waivers because it, it's literally something that's um, yeah it. I don't know how else to say it. That's literally the answer is the, the, the requirement of two spaces per dwelling unit. Um, rather than going to the weeds of like discussing what an answer is or what a number is, what a math is, what's adequate. I think it's just addressing that big picture, which is, is it's, it's the bylaw. The number that the bylaw is requesting is not correct. What is the number? We don't know. And that's why we have this amendment, which is let's discuss it. Um, which we're doing anyways at all these site plan reviews. So um, I guess I don't see what the risk is because it's what's happening anyways. And we're addressing this flaw every single time. Um, so, no. Oh. Thanks, Maria. So I, I see we're like maybe 20 minutes behind this, this ambitious schedule. I think we're doing great. But uh, I, Chris, I had a question about the next item, um, the BL one, and what the, you know, we're not going to have a hearing on that on the twenty first. Correct. That's right. We thought this was an opportunity to present it to you. Okay. Um, so if you want to hear about it, we're here to present it tonight. But if you feel like you'd rather hear about it some, at some future date, you know that. That could be uh, okay. As so, well. Okay, and and that'll be. Or I just I'm just you know don't want to uh, run out of clock here for us. So um, we'll we'll continue talking. Um, Janet, you're so, mute. Oh, thank you. So um, I think that I understand what Maria is saying about the number. I know some parking lots are very full. I know downtown parking there's lots of people in a no parking district you know who are parking illegally or in empty lots um there's a you know there's a quite a oh you're on mute sorry they're showing up in neighborhoods um um there are you know we have the management company a week or two ago saying that they see that undergraduates use one have one car per person. And so I really think that we need to get more information. And so the transportation, the master plan, the transportation plan says that the parking needs study in different areas. When we were talking about this a few years ago, I know Christine Brestrup was saying that we need more study. Um, we can do that. They're not that expensive. The MAPC has ways to do quick parking studies. We might wanna wait a little bit till COVID sort of settles out, but that could just be this fall. Um, it's, I don't, it's like we're zoning in advance of data and information or rezoning and it, it's not, you know, so I just think that we just need to do, we need more information. We have 
some parking, you know, I mean, if you drive around town, you know, the parking are in the lower income, there's fewer cars in lower income places because people can't, I think, afford cars. They may need cars, but they don't have them or maybe dependent on very, very dodgy or slow public transit system that has a strange spoke pattern and then really dies off during the holiday season and the summer. Um, but I just think we need more information. I don't think it's hard to get. I'm not, I'm not wedded to two parking spaces per unit, but do we base it on bed count? Do we base it on, is it student park, is student housing? You know, I, I just don't think we have data to, to make this decision. And I still, you know, and I think there's a lot of just tech, the distinction between a converted dwelling with three units or four units and an apartment just doesn't make, it seems illogical to me. Good, uh, I see no other hands on the board. Um, let's open it up to the, the public. I see Dorothy, hey. Pam. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Hi. Dorothy Pam at 229 Amity Street. Um, well, I could see this parking working uh, only on one condition, which is that we totally acknowledge that we're only interested in providing housing for students. Students can ride bikes, students um, can walk to the campus, students have the opportunity to get a PIA parking permit from the college. So students have options. But this means then that you're saying that you don't want any people with children because um, no matter how income limited you are, I don't see how you get your children to school without a car. And it means we don't want senior citizens downtown either because this is New England and seniors don't want to walk on sidewalks in icy weather um, because they have to avoid a fall. So if you are saying, okay, we're just gonna say, we're just providing housing in our downtown for students, you can you know, kind of get rid of parking. But I'd like to answer the objections to parking spaces, some of them. Um, one is, okay, two spaces, you fought over this. I've heard so many meetings. Uh, I believe that one space per unit is fair and makes sense. And that Janet has mentioned in the past that there have to be some like visitor parking that does not belong to, you know, the unit, but handicapped parking, um, something that could be visitors. So a certain number of places. Um, that kind of parking does not have to be on um, uh, impervious structure. At the Northampton new uh, project, which is being built up, they have um, they don't have two parking spots for per unit, um, but they have an area which will be um, pervious. I don't know whether it's real grass or fake grass or whatever it is, but water can go through it, which, when needed, can be used for parking, and that. You know, and otherwise it just is, is green space. Um, we've also talked about the climate uh, change things. And uh, I feel that electric cars are the answer, the way they're going. Um, I think you can be perfectly climate friendly by requiring electric cars. I mean, in, in, in Amramichi's one, you said two units were told you couldn't even get a parking place. So that was part of their, their lease was gonna be, you can't have a car, but there was gonna be a bike rack. But the fact is when the, developer doesn't have enough parking for his tenants, he finds a way. So we all knew that right next to the place that Mitchie is proposed to build, but is not building on, there was a huge parking lot belonging to a bank. Okay, not one that he could access or people could access, but there was parking available, okay. And on the um, one with Robolesky, I swear I heard that questions asked, will you preserve this old house, which uh, somebody presented me with a very detailed history of that house. And the answer was, yes, yes, I will. I'm keeping that house. And then I find that, oh, the house needs too much work and, and, and I'm gonna take it down for parking. So, you know, they think people need parking, all right? And they, they may come go through you and not giving it the way that the planning board asked for it, but they think people need parking. So I, I think that if you want to have not just students living downtown, if you want to have some older people, if you want to have people with children, you're going to have to provide some parking. Um, but you can, it doesn't have to, I, I agree that two spaces per unit hasn't been flying. But to go below one space per unit, I think is just, just wishful thinking. And it's, it's not really, really good. And I, I think you could open yourself up for discrimination. If it says, people say, 
I can't afford to, can't live downtown and there's an affordable unit. I'd like to live in that. My income meets it, but there's no parking space and I can't afford to go you know, rent a private space and there should have been one for me. So um, I, I think that you don't need to get rid of it all and use that word adequate, which I find is the biggest, you could just drive a truck through it, but certainly you could reduce it to one per unit. Um, and you could think of having uh, some of the extra parking, uh, the few spaces on um, places that are not paved over. So you can deal with some of your water problems there. So I, anyway, I, I think this is a big issue. I think it's really important. And I think it's one of fairness um, to do with parking. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I remember mentioning overflow parking on, on uh, uh, you know, pervious, pervious service, like it, like a, a lawn or whatever. Uh, so that's interesting you brought that up, Dorothy. Uh, well, you know, uh, I don't see other, hand, other hands up. So this is up, oh, Janet. Janet Keller, state your name and address, please. Hi, Janet. Janet, can you unmute yourself? Do it again. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Um, still Janet Keller, still live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road. And I would like to argue strongly for uh, firm but uh, usable guidelines, like one uh, space per unit, regardless of where it is and what it is, um, plus uh, a, a certain percentage for visitor parking. Um, and um, I agree that um, electric cars are coming soon and more and more people are having them. Um, I further agree that um, I don't wanna see an Amherst that doesn't have any families in it. And the families I know need their cars to get the kids to school, to get the parents to work um, and to get the kids to after school things and to go to the doctors and to, which might not be on the bus line, this notion that buses can serve us in a, uh, what is still, whether we like it or not. We live in Western Mass. I don't live in Providence, Rhode Island anymore where I could walk or ride my bike and I did walk or ride my bike lots of places. Um, we, don't, we can't do that if we have a family, maybe students can. So I, I urge you to look at this um, with fresh eyes and, and um, and leave our town um, a welcome place for families, please, as well as students. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. All right. So we can um, move on to the next item. Uh, proposed changes to the BL, limited business zoning district, abutting the BG general business zoning district, including a proposed overlay district along North Pleasant Street and Triangle Street to allow more residential development in the BL zoning district. And well, who do we have presenting? Maureen. Well, hello, hello everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Maureen Pollock. Okay, so uh, I'm here to uh, discuss with you our zoning proposal uh, for creating a new uh, overlay district, uh, the Town Center Limited business overlay district. Uh, so I'll walk you through this. Um, there are uh, two focus areas uh, that this overlay district would apply to. Um, it would be um, the parcels uh, west of um, North Pleasant Street uh, adjacent to Kendrick Park between uh, Coles Lane, uh, Alex Street, and McCullen Street. I think there's n maybe nine parcels or, or something. One, I, I won't count, that's, that's okay. And then the other focus area is uh, these parcels shown here along uh, the corner of East Pleasant and Triangle Street. 
And um, as you can see, uh, uh, um, the surrounding area, it's surrounded by the, um, in this sort of yellow is, um, is the general residence district um, um, at the periphery of, of both of these focus areas. And then we have, of course, the, the, the general business zoning districts um, highlighted in pink. Um, and so, um, uh, and um, back here um, beyond this sort of uh, dotted red line. Um, and uh, so the dotted red line represents the uh, overlay district uh, areas. And um, behind here represents uh, the BL, um, not the overlay district, but just the existing regular old BL uh, zoning district. So here and then here as well. And then this red, uh, blue line rather uh, represents the uh, Lincoln um, Sunset Historic District. So this would be outside of the, that um, Lincoln His Historic uh, District. Um, to the next slide. Um, so the purpose of, of this uh, overlay district is to, to encourage uh, residential development in these transitional zones between the, co uh, the core retail and commercial areas of, of downtown and the adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, and um, in, is to look at the dimensional standards and design guidelines of the BL, BL overlay districts um, for the intention to foster development that enhances the pedestrian experience along the street. Um, and our proposals, uh, our strategies for this proposal is are to create an area along the street that allows flexibility in terms of dimensional standards, uh, determine front setbacks that allow for wider sidewalks in active pedestrian areas along the street and incentivize density along the street away from the adjacent residential neighborhoods. So unlike the uses that we've been speaking about, again, we're talking about it now the district level, the zoning district level. Um, this slide shows the uh, existing BL uh, uh, dimensional re uh, requirements under table three. So of, of importance here, you could take a look at the minimum lot area is 20,000 square feet. Additional lot area per unit is 4,000 square feet. Um, maximum floors uh, allowed would be uh, three floors with a maximum height of 35 feet. Um, and, um, and then uh, single family homes and duplexes are prohibited. Town houses, apartments, converted dwellings and overnight lodging are, are allowed by special permit and mixed use buildings are allowed by site plan review in the BL district um, currently. And so now we'll focus on um, um, we'll, we'll continue talking about this. So uh, um, this overlay district would be mandatory. Um, what, what we'll be showing you in, in, in these slides are not guidelines. Um, and um, after the last CRC meeting, uh, initially both of these uh, air overlay districts would be a hundred feet in depth. Um, but after um, some CRC members suggested, oh, well maybe we'll make it a little uh, wider or increase the depth. So the, um, this North Pleasant Street focus area would have um, the overlay district would have a depth of 115 feet and um, from the property line uh, along here. Um, and uh, over here on Triangle Street, the, it would have a depth of 125 feet um, from the property line. And um, behind here, the BL, the areas behind this overlay district that still is located in the BL uh, would uh, need to um, meet its regular reg regular BL reg dimensional re uh, regulations, but the building height would be limited to three uh, uh, floors for the maximum. And for the overlay district, uh, we would be establishing its own dimensional standards. And so um, now zooming in a bit more to the North Pleasant Street BL overlay district, I'll try to walk you through it. So again, um, A represents the depth of the overlay district, which is 115 feet in depth. B right here shown is the setback uh, 
which is 15 feet from um, the uh, front yard setback on North Pleasant Street. The front yard setback on other streets, such as McCullen, Halleck, and Bowles Lane would be uh, 10 feet. And um, the area um, here, uh, sort of I'm showing in D here, the back, the back of, of these lots are um, areas in the BL zone that are adjacent to the overlay district, but they're outside of it. And those um, vary in depth um, as, as it applies to that specific parcel. And then um, the, uh, the side and rear setbacks within the overlay would be zero. The side and rear setbacks to adjoining districts would be 10 feet. The building height in the overlay, so within that um, red dotted line, um, the building height would have a proposed minimum and maximum uh, for a building height. So the minimum would be 27 feet or two floors and the maximum would be 51 feet or four floors. Um, also to note that uh, we would propose that a minimum of 75% of, of the front facade facing the public way um, shall be located along the front setback line to reinforce the street, side, uh, street sidewalk edge. So what that means is that um, that you know the developer could have a little um, maybe 25% um, corner space that the building then is um, so if 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 the building is along this setback uh, maybe there is a corner pocket um, of the building that's set back and that could be a like a plaza or a cafe or or landscaping and that adds a little uh, notoriety uh, adds a little flavor, if you will, but but for at least a minimum of 75% of that building facade, it would um, be uniformed with the streetscape. Um, also to note with the overlay, um, there, are, there would be no requirements related to the lot and building coverage, lot area, or additional lot area requirements. And the areas um, in the BL zone that are adjacent, but again, back here, they're adjacent to the overlay, but they're um, still in the BL. Um, I, I think I said this before, they would still need to meet the BL uh, dimensional regulations, but the building height back here would have to be limited to three floors or 39 feet in, in height. Um, and um, now focusing on the Triangle East Pleasant Street focus area, um, so the overlay district, the depth of that would be 125 feet. Um, that represented an E. F is showing the front yard setback along Triangle Street. That would be 25 feet. The front yard setback on East Pleasant Street represented in G, it would be a, a minimum of five feet. Um, D represents the front yard setback on other streets, such as, um, so that would be Cottage Street here that would be 10 feet. And then um, D represents um, the adjacent BL district. Um, and um, this, uh, the remainder of, of these rows would be the same as, as the um, other focus area about the side and rear setbacks and the building height and floor uh, floors. Um, and so part of this proposal we uh, want, since this is now, we're scaling up Again, we're looking at the district level. Um, so we want to um, get into standards and conditions. And so we would propose uh, additional um, design guidelines. Um, we do nod to that there would be additional standards and conditions may apply based on the specific use classification as provided in Article 3. Um, and so th obviously th those would still need to apply. Um, we're proposing a frontage zone and so the frontage zone would be the front setback. So that's the space between the front property line and the line of the front facade of the building. Um, and that frontage zone would be uh, the intended purpose of that would be for usable uh, for incidental or accessory activities associated with the building uses. And so um, I just throw out some ideas of my own and you know we can play with other ideas. So these spaces could be landscaping, 
gardens, sidewalks, plazas, sitting areas, and may include am amenities such as benches, uh, sitting walls, and, and planters. And I'm sure the list could go on and on of creative and fun things, uh, and, such as public art and um, art sculptures um, and installations. Um, and so we also are proposing a project open space um, at at the at this um, at the district scale here. And open space uh, would need to be provided for all residential uses, for the use for the occupants and visitors of the building. Um, these spaces may be located anywhere on the property, um, whether or not they're in the B BL overlay district. Meaning, if I, we just jump back to that map, one one of the maps. Uh, meaning that the project open space, you know, it could be in the frontage zone, but it also could be in the side setback, or it could be in this adjacent BL district, um, if it's part of that same parcel, uh, just to show you. Um, and so for buildings with solely residential uses, such as apartments and townhouses, um, the project open space may be provided in the frontage zone. Um, and so for like, uh, so for a mixed use building, um, a mixed use building could have project open space on the side and the rear, but for sole, solely residential, um, um, it, has, it has flexibility of where that could be located. And the project open space uh, would be provided in areas that are not used for parking areas, driveways, HVAC, and utility areas, service areas, or unusable slope area. Um, and so, you know, the project open space is, is really to enhance, you know, this transitional space between the dense downtown and the adjacent residential district. So we want to sort of soften that transition um, between, between the downtown, the street, the sidewalk, the property line, the transition between the property line to the door entrance. Um, so there's moments for rest to gather, to enter um, these spaces and to provide, frankly, you know, amenities for, for visitors and occupants to enjoy. Um, we have some, uh, a concept example. Um, this concept design was prepared by planner, by our colleague uh, planner, Ben Breger. Um, and so, um, I'll just, um, this is what we'll ultimately focus on this parcel here, but just to orient everyone. So um, this is uh, North Pleasant Street. Um, this is where Kendrick Park is. Um, this, um, and the parcels in yellow, highlighted in yellow, those rep that represents the overlay district. And um, in the back, those would be the adjacent, um, BL district area. And so the focus um, for this concept example is looking at this building here. And so we'll go to the next slide. And so um, the project, so in this mock example, um, we, we, we say that this is a mixed use building. So the project open space would be required for the residential uses for the use by the occupants and the visitors of the building. Uh, the project open space is provided along this now we're, we're going to ask everyone to use your, imagina your imaginative goggles that there is on the side and rear of this building that there you may envision maybe outdoor patio area or landscaping, um, maybe a little play area, uh, maybe some garden plot. Um, so with your go imaginary goggles, you could picture that here uh, and, and, and back. Um, and um, this image is showing the frontage zone in front of this building, um, which would be a depth of 15 feet. Um, again, the, the mock development is a mixed use building uh, and it would provide out. Um, and so this mixed use building has a restaurant on the first floor. And so they want, um, the developer is providing a um, outdoor dining area, which would be accessory use associated with the restaurant. And again, putting on your imaginary goggles, maybe uh, you could imagine uh, four feet tall native shrubs provided as a visual buffer 
along um, along the property line actually is this line right here uh, in this particular uh, location. This grassy strip is actually within the public right of way. Um, but you, maybe perhaps you can imagine that there is a, a you know some shrubbery or a low retaining wall that provides sort of a public private semi space um, to help transition between the public right of way and the private development. Um, and here is just another view of um, this development. So the front part of the building, which is in the overlay district, again, um, for this example, the building height would be 54 feet or four, uh, four stories. And in the back, this, so that, that's what I'm talking here, this front part. And then this back part, this would be located in the adjacent underlying BL, but not in the overlay. And so the building height would be um, uh, reduced to uh, three floors. Um, and you can see that there is a setback along um, McCullen Street. And you can see that that um, frontage zone on the front, um, the front setback as well here. And you can see it in, in relation to the neighborhood. And um, here, um, now I'm just showing another image of that frontage zone where, oh, now you don't need your imaginary goggles. So now there is shrubbery on the side setback, um, which provides you know, privacy and a space for visitors and, and occupants. And it, there could be some, you know, some really cool and creative things that are on that side setback. And in this frontage zone, you see that there's a change of surface materials with pavers. You see that there is an awning there's doors with windows, there's tables and chairs, and there is a, a retaining wall. You know, perhaps there's, there could be really some fun uh, uh, string lights um, and um, it, it provides a, a nice transition between the public, um, the, the street uh, to the sidewalk and to the property. And then if you wanna zoom out a little more so up to this point, we've been just talking about the site scale. If we zoom out and think about, let me just go back to something. Now, if we wanna go back to um, thinking about this, um, the next scale up district wise is providing or requiring a frontage zone um, and what, we're saying here would be 15 feet along North Pleasant Street. And here would be, I think we're saying, I should know, I think it's 25 feet. It allows the flexibility for, if not today, if not 10 years from now, or perhaps decades from now, it allows flexibility for the town to, or the developer um, to really think about the streetscapes and what we as a town envision for streetscapes. Perhaps, you know, I, 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 I'm always excited to see people use these shared um, bikes, these electric bikes. Um, you know, perhaps these could be great locations to add more street furniture, such as shared bike stations. Perhaps we're interested in uh, separated bike lanes. Perhaps we would like to really be uh, actively uh, install public art sculptures throughout downtown. Perhaps there's wider sidewalks. Perhaps there are significant more uh, uh, street trees. So when you think about th this small zo zone here, um, this is just a sort of sample of what we could do in other zoning districts. Um, in our downtown and perhaps our village centers. And um, so let me just go see if I have anything else to say. Um, we did, um, uh, um, and I would like to say that uh, Nate Malloy uh, spent a lot of time on this 
Um, and so did Ben and, um, and so it's been, and Rob Mora, and we've, it's been a very collaborative um, effort uh, looking at this. And um, one of the uh, initial recommendations were to provide some design standards for, for the board con to consider. And um, um, which they're all great, um, but we're not ready yet to actually recommend them for our zoning amendment proposal today. So um, they, I think they may be in the packet, but at this time, we just wanna focus on what we truly wanna propose for the zoning amendments and we'll return back to these, um, which gets into building facade, parking and mechanical equipment. So with that, I think I'm done. Questions? Thank you very much. <clears throat> a lot of work has been completed. Um, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna let that digest. I don't really have anything to say right now. Um, and we have Janet. Um, when we last talked about this, I think it was somewhere in the spring. And um, one of the questions the board asked was for unit counts, like how many units um, could be built, like if you maxed it out. And um, since there's no side setbacks requirements, um, the building could be bigger. And then also, we know that a few property owners own like several lots, so they could all be combined. And so I was wondering if you could provide that information for both of these proposals, because I remember when Maria and Andrew and Doug looked at um, the unit count um, under um, footnote, I mean, under the current zoning versus the adjustment in zoning, they felt like there was, it was too dense and it was no longer operating that the BL would no longer be operating as a tra transition zone. So I was just wondering, can you get the numbers for us about, you know, say if the apartments were 500 square feet, um, assuming their apartments or condos, um, how dense can it be? How many units can it be? Um, the other thing I want to say is um, it seems like you have this really strong vision in the planning department and you know, you're, you're working on this. Um, I also know that um, you know, Suzanne Musprat and Pam Rudy presented a vision for this particular section we're looking at that keeps the historic buildings and expands them in a sort of a traditional New England way. Um, I don't think they had specific um, dimensional things and then there was talk on Triangle Street being more garden apartments and more kind of a transition to the neighborhood. And I, everybody has a good vision. I also know that the Pleasant Street area is being considered for being added to the local historic district by the Historical Commission. So I wonder, um, and these are design standards, I wonder, you know, my, my gut feeling is since we're hiring a consultant to look at these issues and work with the community, this would be a great add into the, to the the basket, but it makes sense to me to wait till that person's hired and we work through the process because there's lots of different visions. And um, I do appreciate that, you know, how much work you put into it. And it, you have this very strong sense of what you'd like to see. And I just, I just, I want to appreciate that. Great. Uh, Maria? Thanks, Maureen. That was a really great presentation. Um, I think that's doing a great job of exactly what a lot of people have said they liked about downtown, which is creating a street edge and creating more human scale space um, at the fronts of buildings. And this achieves all of that. It's really great. It's basically form based zoning without the sort of building facade. Mm, well, you did touch on building this out a little bit. So this is really close to form-based zoning. So it's really exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I think also just increasing the density closer to the street not only creates that street edge, but you have the opportunity for more housing, which is always great to have downtown. Um, so yeah, I think this is a great study. And um, I hope that this could inform other areas like the village centers um, and actually, I mean, this is basically form-based zoning, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that it's touching on most of the things that, um, it just, it doesn't also have like stuff like, the, normally there's parking and there's other sort of features that are part of form-based zoning, but um, 
But yeah, it looks like you've spent a lot of time really analyzing these parcels. And yeah, when Doug and I did it, we did it just using math, not, we didn't put on our like architect hats. We just literally sort of plastered maximum build out, um, minimum, well, if each parcel was its own parcel versus all the parcels as one. So we just did some quick math, but this is really looking at it from our urban planners sort of perspective. So I really appreciate that. And you know, that you put a lot of thought as far as like, what do you want to see? And, um, and I like the vision. I think it's a really good direction. Thanks, Maria. Any other comments from the board? Uh, Doug. My, my uh, comment is actually a question. Um, and that is, since this is not going to be part of the public hearing next week, what is kind of next in the process for this? That's a great question. Yes. Is, is there an answer or is it looks like Chris, unknown? Chris has her hand up. So um, I think the CRC thought this was pretty well along and I think they didn't think they needed to see it again. Rob can confirm that, but that's my memory of the CRC's review. So we would just want to get further along with the planning board um, before we um, put this forward. So uh, I meant we'll meet again with the planning board. Okay. I'll look forward to your return. Good. Uh, Tom, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was going to ask the same question about uh, that Doug asked in terms of process. Like, what do, what do we do with this information and how do we move forward with it? And, and what can we do between now and the next meeting um, to, uh, to help move this along? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of late in the evening and, you know, I retained a little bit of it, but <laughs> I will look very forward to uh, seeing it again. Um, well, it's the meeting's being recorded. You all can watch this again oh, tomorrow. It, again and again and again. With your morning like, coffee. <laughs> Nate has um, up and have some idea about where this goes from here. Uh, Nate? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily where it goes. I think that, you know, a number of months ago, Ben and I presented a few um, conceptual designs, you know, 3D designs as well, um, you know, on, on probably a number of properties in this district. And those still comply with these dimensional standards. So, you know, Jana asked about build out. So I think it was, gosh, maybe back at the end of March, but we have models and, you know, we had um, you know, varying size apartments and mixed use buildings and what it would look like. So we can provide that, or it could be in a previous packet just to understand what it looked like. So Ben had done the Triangle Street uh, site and I did, I think, um, you know, a few properties south of Halleck if they were combined and what that would look like. So um, that's one example of what, it, you know, a possible build out following this type of uh, zoning. So there is something that had been presented a while ago. Just, I think, you know, I think it would be easier almost uh, to Janet's point to show like building envelopes. I think, you know, unit sizes can change, right? If you do a three bedroom or a one bedroom, I think it's could be more about the massing, which is what we were trying to get. I think when we did apartments, we had like, you know, a 700 square foot unit or 600 square foot, you know, and so maybe one building could have 40 units, but you know, if you made those smaller, it could become a 60 unit building uh, in the same footprint. But we do have some of those that we could try to get to uh, the planning board pretty quickly just so you can see what that looks like. But, and, and just to add with these, uh, this hopefully I'm showing the screen. Um, so uh, this proposed dimensional standards would help dictate the bulk and mass of the building. Um, so talking about the building height um, and, um, and the amount of floors and, the, the, and how the building is set back from the front, the side and the rear. And so that would help uh, dictate the density within the overlay district. Um, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to mention the fact that um, footnote A would not apply to any of these dimensional standards for the um, BL overlay. These are, you know, you, what you see is what you get. You don't have the op option of asking for a special permit. 
for dimensional modification. So I thought that might um, interest some people. Good, good. Um, let me see what, oh, it is what, 10.15? Yep, 10.15. Um, uh, Janet. So, so I would love to see some unit counts, um, you know, to understand, you know, how the density in a different way. I, I do love the 3D thing. I wonder, I mean, I thought that the, the consultant was be doing handling these kind of design guidelines. And so I'm a little con confused about who, what are we hiring this person for? I thought it was for the downtown um, design guidelines that inform base zoning. And so is, is this aiming towards a final zoning amendment without the consultant or um, I'm just a little lost. Uh, Chris, please. So what we're doing here is we're establishing dimensional requirements for an overlay zone. We're not getting into the design of buildings. We're showing you buildings that could possibly be built there. Um, Nate showed you some fairly um, sort of, uh, what should I say, modern looking buildings. And Ben, has sh ben and Maureen are showing some um, buildings that are more traditional but we're not getting into that kind of design at this level. That's the kind of thing that we would get from our consultant. Here, we're just saying, what would the lot coverage, the height, the setback, et cetera, be for this overlay zone? Just the same way we have other zoning districts which have similar dimensional requirements. So we're just setting up the dimensional requirements here. And when we get to the um, consultant on board, we'll start talking about facades. And do you remember when Nate came through the first time he talked about you can't have more than 80 feet of a, of a wall that doesn't have any change in plane. And when you have your change in plane, it's got to be at least six inches. And sometimes it has to be five feet. And sometimes there has to be a corner carved out for a space. And so those kinds of things are the things that we would look to our design consultant for. But um, setbacks and lot coverage, building coverage and height, I think we can um, handle but doing what we're doing now. This just seems like a sort of a seismic change. And I wonder in terms of heights and density and bulk, and it seems like this would be a great thing for the consultant to work with the community on and the boards. Thank you, uh, Nate, and then Doug. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, this was the, the overlay was also in response to the idea to allow more residential development in the BL, you know, the footnote B additional lot area per, um, uh, per unit and so you know the planning department thought you know we looked at that but that was actually uh, actually more of a relief valve if you kind of waive that that whole piece the four thousand and so you know the idea here is to actually bring development along the street develop a street front have setbacks to allow generous pedestrians you know scape streetscape in front of a building so i think you know this was the, the response to that so you know is, is there a better way than just eliminating a footnote can we actually help uh develop um you know, massing that's in place along the street. I'll also say that, you know, the overlay started almost too as a response or took into account the 40 yard district that the consultants had done. So we actually took some of the work they'd already done through a, you know, a year and a half long process. And we've actually, I think tailored it more to Amher. So we actually reduced the scale of the buildings uh, that the 40 yard was proposing. And we, I mean, we took some of all of that process and, and then distilled it into this overlay. So I think there is a lot of background work that was already done by consultants that was used for this uh, overlay. So I, I, I mean, I agree. I think that if we do have a design consultant, you know, they may look at it and say, oh, well, you know, are there tweaks that could be used? But I think it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, we're, like Chris said, we're looking at dimensional standards uh, that are different than design standards. Um, you know, it can be one and the same, but I think, you know, we're, we're, I think this can be an independent thing that moves forward. And maybe the consultant says, wow, I like these setbacks, the way you're doing it, um, you know, as opposed to a curb to, building frontage, it's a property line setback. That's just, you know, could be a cleaner way for our zoning to work. Um, so I do think there's a lot of background research that went into this that was used to formulate it. Thanks, Nate. That, that's uh, good to hear. Um, uh, Doug? Yeah, with the conversation about the upcoming design consultant, I guess I was wondering with a question for the planning staff, 
whether the planning board would have any opportunity to review the RFP for that consultant and whether we would have any input on the selection of that consultant. Chris? Um, that hasn't been discussed. And so I can certainly um, think about that and get back to you on it. It seems like a good idea to have the planning board have some input on the RFP. I'm not sure about um, the choice of the consultant, but that I can, I can do some uh, asking around and, and see about that as well. So I'll get back to you on that. Super, I um, see no other hands raised, uh, so we can take out to public comment. And I see Dorothy Pam, and then Susanna. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, so there is a point in hanging in there to the end, okay. Um, yeah, this plan does include a lot of the nice things that had disappeared from the mix. And I could see people living there. I could see in my mind's eye, people walking on the sidewalk and, and feeling things. Um, I have my question is just very technical. Um, it's how many feet? So on the drawing, you had first the green along the curb, then you had yellow for sidewalk, and you had a little green on the other side of that sidewalk, and then you had the gray, which I believe you called the frontage area. And so my question is, what were the dimensions not in the area of where the special town is like a it sticks out where there's a little town green there, but in the regular part, what were the dimensions of each piece so that I could get an idea of how many feet back from the street edge is the building where it has the frontage area? Uh, uh, are you talking, which image would you like me to reference? The this? one that with the house, not this one. Uh, the Okay, the concept example, sure. Uh, let's go to it had the green, uh, yellow, and gray in it. Oh, okay. So um, this um, th this where the arrow is pointing um, right here that is mm -hmm. actually the property line, and okay. so um, all here is the public right of way, um, and so this would uh, set back uh, from here to this building wall of fifteen feet. And mm -hmm. that's where the frontage zone would be provided. And if, um, one second, uh, we'll see if, uh, oh, and then here, um, again, that's showing, showing the same information. And then here it's showing um, the side setback, mm -hmm. which is um, um, the side setback would, at, um, would be, within is actually uh, the proposal currently is zero uh, feet, but in this uh, concept design, we were generous and uh, wanted to provide uh, a side setback. And since they are, the developer would be required to provide pro project open space, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would be, it, it would be for, it would be their design. Um, it would be a uh, choice they, they could make. Yeah, yeah, they would need to find a design solution to accommodate mm -hmm. the project open space. So maybe it's on the side, maybe it's in the rear, maybe it's in the front. Um, right. So it gives them that flexibility of where it could be located. But as so, you can see, the majority of the building, the front of the building um, mm -hmm. is, is, has a uniformed uh, building facade and that we would want consistent um, throughout the, that zoning overlay. And you can imagine if this was applicable to other zoning districts. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could see that it then steps back a little bit um, by at least 25% um, uh, um, to allow, you know, a, mm -hmm. perhaps a cafe um, um, or a restaurant or just a plaza where people gather um, uh, for no, you know, for a little, um, like an amphitheater sort of seating um you could be i mean you could right. we could have fun and, and come up with creative uh, ideas all day of what that could look like feet would that be if you have the the 15 foot setback and then you have the 25 percent i don't know how many feet the 25 percent would be just 25. trying to imagine how much space there might be uh what is the 25 percent sorry um 
Oh, I'm not so oh, 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 uh, where, um, so a minimum of 75% of, of the front facade facing the public way would be located along the front set back line to reinforce. Um, so, um, so this maybe been exaggerated, um, the percentages, but you can see that, that the majority of the building facade is, is, would be at the consistent 15 foot setback. And that, that, and um, we'll say that maybe that's 75% of the building will, we'll pretend that that is 75%. And then um, that uh, there would be a portion of the building that would be set back further to provide a more ample, a portional um, outdoor space. And if you recall in earlier rev revisions, I believe we had a percentage for the project open space. And after much discussion, um, we, I kind of forget what that percentage was, maybe 10%, 20%, I, I don't remember anymore. Um, and, but we felt that, uh, that, that it needs to be uh, the, the project open space should be dictated on the, the use classification, the density of the development and the intensity of the development. And those factors will help dictate the amount of project open space. So for instance, if you had a five unit apartment building, perhaps you're not gonna have a gigantic play equipment area. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have a apartment building that has, I don't know, 25 units, well, now we're talking. Maybe now we can have an outdoor plaza. Maybe we can have a little uh, pavilion area. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if the building's larger than that, n now we're talking. Now we can say, well, we would want your project open space proportional to that use classification, the density of that use, and the intensity of that development. And when I say intensity of that development, we're talking about how many people are coming and going out of that building. We're talking about how many occupants, how many visitors, um, and um, how much foot traffic, how much uh, cars are coming in and out, um, things of that nature. Um, and so that, that would, um, help dictate uh, for the board um, mm -hmm. what, what they would see as a reasonable project open space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy, uh, Susanna, and then Kathy. Hi, Susanna. Hello, Susanna Muspret, 38 North Prospect Street. I have to say that Thank this you. is way past my bedtime, um, and I hope I'm still making some sense. Um, I was surprised that the purpose of the BL overlay district is only to encourage residential development. Is it not also for businesses? I mean, limited business? That doesn't seem to be even on the agenda anymore. Well, it would be, um, it would be my understanding that any proposed development in the overlay district would be what's, you know, what's permitted in the BL uh, district. So, so we're it could be all apartments, right? Well, it could be, it could be a mixed use building. It could be, um, yeah, it'd be kind, of, it'd be kind of nice if it mentioned that it had something to do with business. Um, so the dimensions that have changed a lot since the last time this came to the planning board and I am having real trouble understanding what um, the, the new height limit of 51 feet, what that looks like. I would really appreciate it if you would show us uh, hypothetical buildings that were the maximum that could be built on these two blocks because we know that one developer owns the whole first block and it could be that there would be one building there. And I also would really appreciate it if you would show us some sections that help us understand how these buildings at 51 feet at the maximum, I mean, what I would call the worst case scenario, you probably call it the best case scenario. What, 
how that would line up with the the uh, archipelago buildings across the street. And I would like to see um, this height against St. Bridget's Church so that I have some points of reference. And I think that would help a lot of people uh, who don't have a mental image of what exactly 51 feet looks like. I think it's really important that the council understand what it's voting for. This is a huge amount of building for this area that we're used to seeing as a very sort of modestly scaled transitional zone. And I think we deserve to understand what these changes could in fact bring upon our town. Thank you. Thank you, um, Nate and well, Chris, you did have your hand up. Okay, so Nate. Oh, you know, thanks Suzanne. I think, um, you know, uh, not just a section uh, showing a height. I think, you know, what's important here too is we have a setback from the street and then there's, you know, um, so we have a you know a new front setback and then there's also the property line. So for instance, along North Pleasant Street, you know, from Coles to Halleck, you know, the, the property line's about 25 to 30 feet off the curb and then we have another 15 feet. So even if the building is taller, you know, I would say we could also do sections from building, a potential building across the street to the across the street to the you know one east pleasant or to zana block and show kind of that whole um street perspective because i think that's helpful as well um you know i think comparing heights is also helpful but you know you could say wow that's a really tall building but if it's now 20 feet further back from the sidewalk than what um we're currently seeing then the you know the relative height to the pedestrian zone is different so i think having that whole you know street side is, you know, one side to the other side sections in a number of places would, would be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have uh, Kathy, uh, Shane. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Hi, I'm still at 519 Montague Road. Um, I just have two questions that build off actually what Nate just said. Um, when I'm looking at the memo, I think I'm reading it correctly that the building coverage goes from no more than 35% to no, no maximum is the way it's written. And, and is that you're trying to set it further back from the street and do a variety of things that minimize the building coverage? Because that uh, BG has 70%. So it could be 100% is, is the way I'm reading it with building coverage. I'm not doing lot coverage right now. So that's a question if I'm reading it right. Then as a transition, BG has a height of 55 feet. BL currently is 35 feet. And this has a 51 foot height. So it's not much of a transition. Um, you know, so there's something in between there like 45 feet that would be more. So just a question of where 51 came from. So it's a question of why 51. And the um, this relative scale, um, it would help me understand public way and property line. If per this particular, we knew where the public way was. And Chris, you told me one point, I can't make a guesstimate. I have to go on the GIS map for each. So. It seems like the public way here may be deeper in this area before you hit property line. So just that sense of scale, you know, would be helpful. Um, I was told, I live on Montague Road that I can't guess public way if I go up and down the houses, I have to go to each property. So I don't know how much it varies. Um, so that's where you're measuring from the public way and then the setback is from the property line. So when you talk about relative to the height, to the street, but just put some of those on these maps too. That would just be helpful for me um, to get a sense of that. So my first question is, am I right that building coverage could go to 100% of whatever is left after you've set back, um, which is more than BG, but maybe you've set aside enough lot that it's not more. Um, so there, there wouldn't be a building coverage requirement within the overlay, but the, um, the 
area behind the overlay that's in the, the BL, existing BL, would need to meet the, uh, the building coverage requirement. And I'm looking at table three right now, and that would be at 85%. However, well but that's lot coverage. I'm talking about building. Oh, build, oh yeah, uh, building coverage. Sorry, thank you. It is it is getting late. Uh, building coverage, uh, maximum building coverage within the BL is at 35%. Yeah, and I just, at least that means a physical structure with no maximum could be 100% other than what you've done. Um, and I just would like some, is that what's being proposed? And does that mean there's nowhere for the rainwater to go down into the ground? So I just I just want some sense of what that means if the building could be that much of it. That's it. It's so it's it's a comment and a question. And I don't need an answer tonight. Sure. Very good. Um, thank you, Kathy. Uh, going back, uh, Chris, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to answer partially answer Kathy's question. Um, so the right of way line is the property line. So the right of way takes up, you know, all the property that the town owns that includes sidewalk and roadway and green uh, strips and trees and whatever the town owns is considered the private or uh, the public way. And the edge of the public way is the property line of the private property that abuts the public way. Does that make sense? It does. And I just want to know how much is the public way because it's, is it 10 feet of public way or is it 20 feet of public way? That's in it. Varies, varies all over the place. Right. So in these dimensional things for this overlay, I think it's particularly important that at least in these sections, we get that wiggle line that's called public way. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I, you want to see that on a map. Yeah, it was just to make it clear to me that the property line is right up to the public way and then we're measuring, but I don't know where the public way is. Yeah, so um, I think, Kathy, just quickly, I think there's a difference. That's why Triangle Street has a 25 foot setback mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the red dotted line, it, the property line is actually right on the curb, mm -hmm. right? So we want a deeper setback there. So that's why it's 25 feet. Whereas if you go to North Pleasant Street, the property line, the red dashed line, is anywhere from 20 to 30 feet um, from the curb, uh, just because it's a more generous right of way. And so that's why there's only a 15 foot front setback. So we're, those front setbacks are in response to how close the property line is to the curb edge now. I think, I understand what you're saying. I think we could, um, we could diagram that uh, just to illustrate that a, um, a different way. Um, but that's what, so that's what, you know, where the, where the cursor is right now, that's a 20 foot, that's about 20 feet from, you know, property line to right of way, you know, to the curb edge. So there's 20 feet within the right of way that is not roadway. Thank uh, you. Uh, and then I just want to say quickly about the building coverage. And we talked about this a little bit too. I think, you know, right, if you look at the blue, you think, wow, that could be a really massive building. But in reality, someone's not going to make a building that's 100 feet deep. Most of the buildings are, you know, anywhere from 50 to 75 feet deep. You know, if you think of an apartment, a double loaded corridor, office space, just to have such a massive building, you don't allow, there's not a lot of light. So there's a lot of interior. So most people are not building a building that is 100 feet by 100 feet, right? They're just not building a big block. Even the bigger ones downtown are no deeper than typically 65 feet. Um, yeah, there might be an L-shaped, so it might actually be longer than 100 feet, but the depth of the building typically isn't much deeper than 70 feet. So I, I, I think that's a really good question about what the building coverage would look like. So in, in concept models, we can show that, but I don't think rare, rarely would you see a building that is just so massive, right? That would actually take up the whole overlay. I think in reality, the overlay is deep enough to give a developer flexibility in how they design the site uh, in the building. No, the hope is not that they would just put a huge, massive um, <laughs> building. Thank you. Uh, Doug? Yeah, Jack, seeing as this is our first conversation of this, and we will have at least one more, 
I wondered if we were going to have very much more conversation tonight because I'm going to need to peel off. Oh, I think we're done. I think we, the Kathy was the last one. And uh, we just have a few more items to get through, but I think we're all done with, with the BL discussion. So thank you very much, Maureen, Nate, and Chris for all your input. And Rob, for your presence, constant presence. <laughs> so uh, old business? No old business. Okay, and new business? No new business. And forum a and r yeah, we have a, we have a form A, and Pam can bring it up on the screen. Um, and I'll just describe what it is. Um, Kay Atkinson owns a doctor's office of practice on um, Research Drive over in East Amherst off Belcher Town Road. And um, she would like to build a parking lot uh, for herself um, a little bit farther down the street. She needs more parking. So she's purchasing a piece of land from Mr. Alan Birkenwald. Um, and Alan Birkenwald owns this property that's outlined here in yellow. You can see where it's located along Old Belchertown Road between Research Drive and Haley Village uh, Place. Um, so he's carving off the back portion of his property to sell to Kate Atkinson to construct this parking lot. And Pam can show you the, the map. Uh, Mr. Birkenwald owns the area that's outlined in green. Um, he's proposing to sell Ms., uh, the Dr. Atkinson the area that is to the left of that red line, um, which is, uh, what is it, 0.8 acres. And what we need you to tell us is that um, this is not a subdivision in terms of the usual um, use of the word subdivision. In other words, ANR means it's not, um, it's uh, uh, approval not required. Right. Subdivision control approval is not required for this division of this property because we're not creating subdivision. So um, I would ask you to authorize Jack Jemsik to sign this um, ANR plan on behalf of the planning board. And then um, Dr. Atkinson can move ahead with her project. And by the way, this is coming in under Article 14. And I'm sorry, I think um, I saw Rob Mara leave just now because he might have been able to explain to you um, about the use of Article 14 in this, um, in this uh, arena. But essentially what it means is that the building commissioner can um, approve a project such as this without it having to go through site plan review or special permit. Um, and it's a, it's a result of the um, COVID emergency. And Article 14 is in place through December 20 of 2021. So, it's, but parking lot aside, what we're asking you to do here is authorize Jack to sign this um, ANR plan. Okay. Any questions from the board? I see none. Okay. Uh, so I guess is is there any uh, anyone object to me signing this? Just raise your hand. See none. Okay. So we'll make arrangements to get together for you to sign the plan. Yeah. So um, anything else? Nope. Okay. So report of the chair, I, I think, Chris, maybe you could just report the town council decisions on the uh, building moratorium and uh, inclusionary zoning, just in case yep. people aren't aware of it. So the town council voted on Monday night to um, approve the inclusionary zoning bylaw, and that was a vote of 13 to zero. And I don't believe there was any discussion. They seem to be convinced that that was the right thing to do. Um, on the moratorium, um, they voted uh, four in favor and uh, nine not in favor of uh, the moratorium. So the moratorium did not pass. That was, that was the result. And I'm very happy to report about the inclusionary zoning. I think that's really important. And um, yep, the developers are already paying attention to, to that. So it's a good thing. 
Good. Uh, anything else, Chris? I, let's see. Oh, I should make sure that I tell you what's on the agenda for next Wednesday. For next Wednesday, we have public hearings on mixed use buildings, apartments, the parking that we showed you tonight and ADUs, accessory dwelling units, which we showed you a couple of months ago and you all said it was good. Um, so that's what we'll be having the public hearing on next week with it to be a joint hearing with the CRC. And as I said before, if you don't feel comfortable voting, you can continue the public hearing. You can ask us for more information. Um, so that's, that's the story. Okay. Great. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll, maybe we can squeeze in the minute, the review of the minutes uh, as well there. So next week. Uh, yeah, but see we'll how it goes. <laughs> so uh, I guess we can adjourn. Good night, everyone. Thank you. What was this? Four hours and 15 minutes. And 40. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty long, Mr. Jemsick. Yeah. Good night. Kept to the Bye. schedule. Good night. Good night. Where's my hand? There's my hand. <laughs> Stop the cloud recording.